Department for Health and Social Care, and Jonathan Marron, the Director General for Public Health at the Department for Health and Social Care. And I'm delighted that we're joined today by Greg Clark, the Chair of the Science and Technology Committee here in the House of Commons, who is a guest on our committee uh, today. Um, before we go into the main session, I just wanted to um, ask you some questions, Sir Chris, about the letter you sent us in response to our request for information about care home discharges. Um, and I mean, in summary, the letter says it's, it's a lot less certain about the testing levels that can prove that people had COVID when they left hospital and went into care homes than we had perhaps been led to believe before. It goes into a lot more detail. Would you like to comment? Um, well, I'll give some comments and then I'll hand over to Dr. Harris, who um, has been uh, looking at this both, both both in her previous capacity as Deputy Chief Medical Officer and in her current uh, capacity. Uh, now, first thing to say is obviously this is an incredibly important topic um, and is uh, worthy of uh, deep scrutiny. And I know Mr. Clark's committee has been looking at this uh, as well. Now, we are not saying, and this, I want to be very clear about this, that the, uh, the, that the PHE study you were uh, asking about is the definitive story here. This is a matter that is still under scientific uh, debate. This is one contribution uh, to that scientific debate, but there are, uh, uh, there are several others. Um, now, what we will say, however, is though, though that scientific debate has not concluded, and there will clearly be a lot more study of this uh, important question, um, all the studies we have at the moment are pointing in roughly the same direction. We have, a, a, as we quoted in the letter, uh, a study from Scotland and a study from Wales uh, using different methodologies that all point in the same direction. I think there are some others as well. And we don't currently have studies pointing the other way. So and when you say in the same direction, you mean community transmission is what well, you're saying is more that, that, the reason? That um, the discharge from a hospital was not a uh, 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 particularly significant vector of transmission in this case. I mean, it, they point to various things, but mainly community transmission. So the importance of this for us um, is this as a part of a number of studies. And to get a full picture, we clearly have to look across uh, those studies. So I'll turn to Jenny on the specific questions you're asking on this study, but I wanted to put it in that context. And as I say, make very clear that we don't think this is the end of the debate. We think there is a debate that is pointing in a very clear direction and we don't have any evidence going the other way at the moment but you know, just formally for the record that debate has not concluded in the scientific community but Jenny do you Dr. want to... Dr. Harris is well we're having the debate but it seems that the data is, inadequ is inadequate to actually really give a very clear story on this. So, so I think the, the data is difficult in adult social care which I think we've learnt through, through this exercise and in fact what's in the letter are a number of studies so some of the best data actually is, is Wales uh, they have sale data which has very good linkage across community data but nevertheless the PHE study uh, looked at those cases who were confirmed positive, and I'll come back to that because I realise that's one of the potential critiques, and followed them through to see which associated cases there were in care homes. <clears throat> and at the time that study was on, I was actually chairing, this in my previous DCMO role, the care subgroup. Uh, we had a number of people looking at this. It wasn't just a Department of Health. It was actually included... For example, people uh, are represented from the National Care Forum, from uh, other de uh, devolved authorities um, and scientists around, and we actually held a care summit as well to check that all of the data and all of the findings uh, were tallying together, if you like. Um, there were other studies, as uh, Sir Wilmot has said, uh, relating to... Um, uh, looking the other way, if you like, so trying to see what had happened in care homes and how many of those you could trace back. There was the SIREN study, which of course is ongoing and provides ongoing information uh, through the pandemic, and then Scottish and Welsh studies as well, and all of those studies point to, as community levels rise, uh, the, the rates in care home staff rise, and that appears to be the biggest ingress risk for care homes. Okay. So it, it doesn't say that there are no cases coming in from, from uh, hospitals, and I think that's what the PHE study said, but it definitely suggests that those are by far the minimum number. In terms of the data, one of the things that jumps out is that if someone was tested having left a residential address but then moved to a care home afterwards, the test result would be registered to where they had lived rather than where they were going. That's just one example. Is there any other, uh, what, uh, you know, you're, you're in charge of a lot of this now, so what will you be doing differently 
to make sure that proper data is collected because it's a very serious issue and it's and it has you know we saw very high rates of deaths in care homes and lots of people yeah. bereaved obviously as a result and of course actually what we've seen in the second wave is a significant reduction in that and that is where we've put in a testing both PCR and lateral flow device testing for care staff on a regular basis coming in and also prevented um, movement of staff between care homes and that has had a very significant impact so if you look back at the uh, mortality rates in uh, care home residents during the second wave and particularly now obviously with vaccination we are in a completely different place to where we were in the first one so I think so going back to your point that the data is an important issue um, it is both about the, the PHE piece of work actually was extremely difficult and very labour intensive in order to try and link that data and I think there is a, a recognition going forward that all parts of the health service need to link that data. Right because that's I mean that's really the point that, that point. you're now going to be in control of a system that could sort this out because it we this is the vaccine may help with this pandemic but so you are going to be looking at this and making sure there's proper checking tra t t testing and tracing so that you can keep the data and look back and see where the problems are quickly. Yes, so certainly th this was about linkage between hospital data yeah. and residential yeah. care. And as you say, obviously patients or, or care home residents move very quickly. Um, they won't all be in my remit, but there is definitely, um, in, and I'm sure we'll come to this, in the Health Security Agency, a real move to use data and analytics to... Uh, so you just really slightly alarming there saying it's not all in your remit. Who, Which other bodies are involved? So, I'm going to bring so in Greg Clark in a moment as well. On this. Uh, well, obviously it involves hospital data and general practice yeah. data because residents move. And one of the problems you'd have seen with this was that an so, individual... Yeah. So, so that we know that on the ground. So who, though, in government, maybe it's Sir Chris, but who is responsible if it's not all down to the UK Health Security Agency, who will be responsible for making sure that we don't have that gap if, God forbid, there's another outbreak or a future pandemic? Well, um, I'll answer that. So um, uh, as you probably know, the, uh, uh, we've just actually published a new data strategy, um, which is aimed to bring this uh, uh, together. It is, as this committee is well aware, a complex picture because Health Service owns its own data, um, uh, etc. So what UKHSA uh, will be doing is they should be the people who make sure that all of that adds together. Um, in a way that allows us to deal with pandemics uh, 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 better uh, than uh, uh, in future. That's not the same as owning all the data, because obviously yeah. NHS data is used for lots of purposes and uh, is. Um, uh, there will be a controlling maybe. mind in your department. Yeah, well, I mean, we 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 look across the. Um, uh, 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 the whole of health and care, as you know, um, we don't own all that data either. Um, but it is our role to make sure that there is a framework in place so that UK HSA can do its uh, uh, do its job properly. Just on the general and your point, I mean, I think you're completely um, uh, you're completely right. I would say this situation compared to the first wave is completely transformed. I mean, da data sharing has been uh, one of the big advances we've made. Uh, during the pandemic um, and of course the the what one of our challenges here was the creation of data in the first place and the very low levels of testing capacity compared to what we had now um, as a um, com uh, then as opposed to uh, as opposed to now so on your lessons learned question we are in a completely different place uh, than we were at that point and clearly one of the things we'll want to be doing is making sure we retain that capacity and that way of working yep. going okay. forward whether we're in a pandemic or not Greg Clark, Chair of the Science and Technology Committee. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you for uh, having me here. Um, uh, as uh, Sir Chris said, the Science and Technology Committee has taken interest in this report. Uh, we, we've, we thought it's a somewhat strange report, I might say, from Public Health England. Um, it, it came out without any fanfare and seemed not to focus on the key point, which is this, as we all know, there's a, there's a big question, and we're keen, everyone's keen to get to the bottom of it, of how during the early weeks of the pandemic, uh, the discharges for hospital, whether or not they contributed to infections in care homes. Uh, and yet the, the report that was commissioned, uh, until the chair asked her questions, uh, gave a summary from the 30th of January to the 12th of October, um, in other words, long after this initial period, whereas the, the focus of interest is on those early weeks. Um, and so we didn't understand why, in commissioning the report, it was decided to pool all of that data together. I don't know whether, Dr. Harris, you 
you, you recall why, why um, that decision was so made? So I think I wasn't personally responsible for commissioning it. I certainly was in receipt of it as it right. came in for significant discussion, as you can imagine, in the care subgroup and, and for for challenge, appropriate scientific discussion and challenge. Um, I, I think actually part of the issue, as we've just described, is trying to get the right data sets uh, in order to get sufficient numbers. And I think um, PHE, as far as I understand it now, have supplied a split of data for you, which broadly uh, evidences the same thing in both the, the pre-period, if you like, the early one and the later one. But it was simply, in many of these cases, just to get sufficient sample size to draw uh, robust conclusions from them. And I'm sure that was all that they were doing at the time. Who did commission it? So, Chris, did you commission it, or was it um, the former Secretary of State? Um, I'd have to go away and check exactly who commissioned it and who took that thing. But the, um, but the idea was, as Jenny said, to get an overview of um, what was happening, not solely to answer the question that you're uh, asking, but uh, to understand uh, how transmission happens in uh, care homes. Um, but uh, as Jenny says, I think the data that you're after is available. And, and as far as I understand it, it doesn't show a different pattern, does it, Dr. Harris? No. But they, the problem was, and is this, uh, is it not, that in order to identify someone that had COVID during that time, the period, say, from the end of January to, uh, to the middle of right. April, the beginning of April, you needed to have a test that was in order to, to, to join the sample, as it were, you needed to have tested positive for COVID. But we know that there were hardly any tests uh, being made uh, at that time. In fact, during March, um, there were uh, as little as 1,500 tests a day across the whole country, well, much this more is, than two well, this is why I say parliamentary constituency. The, 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 this goes to exactly the point that I uh, started with. Um, that clearly tells you something, uh, because of course, if you uh, uh, if you went on to develop symptomatic uh, COVID, then you were tested wh wh wherever you were, and you then, as uh, Dr. Harris was describing, can track back where did that patient come from. Uh, so that's one part of it. But it's also why it's very important to look across the studies as opposed to say, this study provides the answer. So as I understand the, uh, uh, the Scottish and Welsh studies, uh, they were looking at the correlations uh, between discharge patterns and other factors, i.e. regardless of testing. So look, look at where the outbreaks were, what were the common characteristics of the patients in those things. And they found, as, as I say, evidence that goes in the same direction as the PHE study. And this is why I started with the point that we should not over-focus on a single study here. What we have is a series of scientific investigations which between them give us the, uh, uh, the pattern that Dr. Harris uh, described and well, not it, to labour the point, my, not complete yet. So my concern is that excessive weight might be placed on something where the, uh, the, the impossibility uh, of knowing who was coming into care homes uh, with COVID was palpable because there were not the, the number of tests available. And, uh, uh, yes, and, but we, and yes, but what we do know is where, where were discharges made to and where were outbreaks, as it were. Now, and that is clearly, in the situation that you describe, extremely important evidence about what the relevant correlations were. Your point about let's not over-rely on a single methodology and a single study, I agree with 100%, which is why I started with the uh, phrases The deployment of this study, um, including by the former Secretary of State when he <coughs> appeared before our committee, actually placed great weight uh, on this. And, and I just wonder whether, Dr. Harris, that you know, it's important that we do shine a light on this, and it's, it's difficult given the, the lack of data, but to, to draw the conclusion that the seeding from hospital uh, is relatively small. That seems, uh, that seems a little premature, premature given the, um, this is one very methodologically constrained, if not suspect, way the, of proceeding. The researchers who were doing this piece of work actually reported back on a regular basis to the social care working group. Um, and actually the purpose of that group, and I, 
was, was actually to answer the question, where is infection coming from in care homes with a completely open mind? Um, and so this is, as Sir Wilmot has said, this was just one piece of that. It was as robust as it could be. I'm very confident that the caveats around the data are written into the paper. And in fact, the caveats go both ways because somebody, for example, coming from hospital uh, may actually have got their infection before. Uh, they may, somebody who then goes on to have an infection uh, may actually get it from the care home. And it becomes extremely difficult without genomic studies to actually track this round. When we've looked at genomic studies, so there was some really good work in East Anglia, relatively small amounts. Uh, you got quite a varied pattern. Uh, most of them, the majority were staff coming in and out, which is, and then you could track the genetic family, if you like, of the virus. Uh, but you would see occasional ones coming in from hospital as well. But of course, if a patient has, for example, gone from residential care into hospital, then been discharged out again and then become symptomatic and tested, they may actually have got their infection starting in the care home, not from the hospital. So I think the study, all the points you make are entirely valid, but they actually apply to the difficulties of translating this, particularly with elderly people who have very unusual and often absent symptomatology. That's completely understood, and it's about the, the weight that's placed on the, the conclusions. Uh, given, uh, as Chris said, the, the importance of having different perspectives uh, on it, um, a peer review um, and the openness of data is very important. You'll, you'll know, uh, Dr. Harris, from, from your work, how reproducibility um, of empirical analysis is very important. Um, you've been, Mr. Chris has been helpful in splitting the data out into uh, the, the early phase and the later phase. Would you make available that data uh, so that other researchers um, can, can make their own uh, calculations based on it uh, in the interests of um, transparency and getting to the bottom. Of I'm very confident that the paper has been peer reviewed already, but it was actually peer reviewed in action because many of the researchers working on this topic were in the social care working group actually critiquing each other's uh, documents and trying to draw those conclusions. So, in fact, the, uh, the purpose of that group was to try and find information as early as possible because of the significant um, morbidity that was uh, affecting care homes and pass that to uh, operate to, um, to ensure policy was developed as rapidly as possible. So every time a recommendation was made or a finding was there, it was having automatic scrutiny from some of the leading academics and researchers right across the country and right across the UK. Well, that's very helpful to know because um, we, we didn't get clarity on whether it had uh, or not been peer reviewed. If you're able to, to supply very the referees, very that happy would be to confirm that, but as I say, every uh, article here, and in fact the other documents that were here, we would, so the Scottish study and the Welsh study, because we had very helpful contributions from individuals in all of the um, UK countries, they would be contributing to the discussion uh, and critiquing so it at the time. You will make the data set uh, available for researchers to... to uh, it's obviously not my data set, but we can certainly <laughs> provide, I'm sure PHE can, can provide whatever uh, evidence... There's a huge public required. interest in this, and I think, I think I'm sure... Yeah, we'll, we'll go and confirm exactly what um, is uh, available on what isn't and whether we ought to go further, yes. I'm sure the Science and Technology yeah. Committee can see yes. anything that's but, not I public mean, and secret. Uh, as I, as but, but as I say, do want to be crystal clear on this. We, 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 we do not disagree with anything you have said, Mr. Clark, here. It is very important to look across the various studies here and to note that this is not, uh, uh, not a complete thing yet. Um, and I... Uh, as you would expect, I chose my words very carefully at the beginning of this. We All the studies we have point in the same direction. We don't have any pointing the other way. So we do think there is a significant point to be made here, but we recognise that is not the final story. That's uh, understood. Okay. Thank Great. Thank you very much, Mr Clark. Uh, Nick Smith. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, morning, all. Uh, um, Mr Mormont, um through to our last session on... PPE and your letter since. Yes. I've got a couple of questions. Please. Yeah, I'm actually going to pass this to Mr. Ma uh, Mr. Marron, who is uh, much more of an expert on PPE uh, than I am and has appeared before you uh, before. So I'll leave I'll leave the answers to him if that's okay. Of course, of course, uh, uh, sir. At the worst of the pandemic uh, between March and July 2020, the department was distributing some 500 million pieces of PPE, and that, that was great work. Uh, but from May to July, uh, you ordered uh, uh, for the 28 billion items, uh, enough for over four years. Uh, why did you buy so much PPE then? 
So um, we've, we've bought in total 32 billion items of PPE. Um, we have already supplied 11.7 billion to the front line to health, social care, um, a few other uses. Um, we currently expect to use another 11 over the cost of the year. Essentially, we're providing about a billion items a month um, the run. And of those billion um, uh, a month, uh, a sort of a significant portion now going through the PPE portal, which uh, you remember yeah. now providing free care, um, free PPE to social care, to GPs, to pharmacies, uh, in a way that we weren't able to at the very beginning when we had an emergency service for those um, areas. So significant increase in the amount going through. In terms of how much we bought overall, we were working on uh, several uh, assumptions, and our overall stance was to make sure we we bought enough. Um, you, you remember. Yeah. March, April, May, you know, the, the yeah. pressure that, and, uh, and the absolute importance of making sure that our staff are protected. So um, we looked at, uh, with no really prior experience of how much PPE would be used in this kind of circumstance. So we had to build a theoretical model. The model was based on modeling how many interactions we felt there would be between patients and staff, both with COVID. So really important, particularly for things like um, FP3 respirator masks, only really used with COVID patients but also general interactions with the public and staff, because uh, as the guidance changed end of March, early April, we started to use PPE on a precautionary basis for any interaction between uh, a member of the public and a, a health or a care worker. Uh, so you know, a massive uh, increase in the use of PPE and not just based on cases, based really on activity in the NHS and social care. Um, our models for that, we, uh, you know, for COVID cases, we used the worst case assumptions that were around at that stage. And for how much activity in the NHS, we made assumptions on how quickly it would open up. Uh, I think as it turns out, you know, our model was generous on the amount of activity that would be undertaken and therefore the amount of PPE. So our model probably overestimated. The second set of issues were really around um, in those very difficult days, whilst we were purchasing and placing contracts, we were not certain that the contracts would come through. So, you know, in March, April, May, into June and July, we simply weren't getting the orders through that we were expecting. And so we made additional purchases to cover what we expected to be a significant shortfall in uh, order fulfillment, if you like. As it turned out, most of those orders came through late as opposed to didn't come through at all, which has ended up with us having slightly more. Obviously, this puts us in a position where uh, we have very significant stocks, um, which I think has allowed us to be really confident that we can meet the needs of health, of social care and indeed provide PPE to open up um, the wider economy. Schools have had significant uh, PPE for us to help in their opening up over the last period. We've been able to help with transport. So I think, um, you know, a really strong position. It's not over yet. So we're looking at making sure that, you know, we can use our stocks. And in the areas where we do feel we have more than we're likely to use, we're looking at possibilities to sale, uh, whether we can look at uh, overseas donations, and for you know the bits of stock that are actually um, you know about 0.5, 0.8% of the stock that we have is not fit for any purpose, and we started to look at repurposing that. We've managed to recycle some of our um, out-of-date visors into food trays. So look, there's some interesting things we're doing to try and deal with the end. But I'd go back to the beginning. Um, the purchasing decisions were really clear. The mission was to make sure we had enough. And if we took some conservative assumptions around what we would need, it was driven by the fact we did not want to run out. Okay, thank you for that. Can you send us more detail uh, later about your recycling visors yes. into food trays? Of your long answer, that's the bit that caught my eye. I must admit. <laughs> uh, coming on the diversionary tactics, yeah. there, Mr. Marin. Yeah, it works. It <laughs> but works. Mr. Smith's not, not going to be right to us. Yeah, <laughs> Mr. Smith. I'm a bit unsure about it. So yeah, more information, please. So I want to pick up this point about contracts. Um, uh, uh, and in Mr. Wormel's letter, um, you probably kindly drafted it for him, um, uh, department outlined very high levels of PP in stock, which you talked about, yeah. but some of these contracts are still to be met uh, and would likely involve uh, hundreds of millions of pounds of what may be unnecessary expenditure given, I mean, looking at the letter we were sent last week, some items you've got stocks that may last you up to six years yeah. uh, so um, how successful have you been in negotiating those contracts down and can you quantify the uh, financial downside or the risk if that's not possible because it, it's a lot of money yeah okay so look at the, the um, 
To date, we have secured um, through either negotiated cancellations or um, variation in the contract, a reduction of PPE of around a billion items at a value of 475 million. So that, that's money we, we don't need to spend and PPE that we won't be seeing. Um, we are in commercial discussions on a further 40 contracts to a value of 1.2 billion and relating to another 1.7 billion items. Now, that, those discussions are ongoing. Let's see where we get to at the end. I, I, I'm obviously happy to update the committee as we come to the end of those um, uh, negotiations. But that's where we are currently, if that is a helpful update. So pleased to hear that. Uh, but given what we know about the 30 odd billion items of PP that were ordered in the end, that's a, a small percentage. And given the high cost of it, um, can we please, with your next update, uh, have an assessment about uh, the risk and the money that you hope to save, please? Yes, of course. Okay, thanks. Um, third question comes back to, uh, given this large stock, uh, and that you're good, going to be giving it away, and that's great, because you know I can think, of course, we all can, about the social care sector and others might needing it in the future. Um, but the nub is, won't it be very hard for domestic suppliers and manufacturers to maintain their business in this market, given that it's pretty much drowned with PPE that you've already got in stock? So I think on the UK manufacturing, the sort of UK Make programme, I think it's been one of our great successes. Um, of the 30 billion items, two and a half billion are from UK manufacturers, and much of the material that's yet to arrive is, of course, the ongoing contracts with those uh, manufacturers. So that, that's there. Um, I think the thing that's often missed in the discussion about UK make is actually the investments that, that companies have made uh, in machinery, in plants, um, is allowing them to compete in the global market at, at a competitive price. This idea that the UK is a, always a high cost environment is, is not true. Um, whilst it might be difficult in some of the really labour intensive markets, you know, um, gowns, for example, you know, lots of um, hand sewing. Uh, where it comes to things like masks, uh, visors, aprons, uh, much, much more likely um, that we can meet a uh, competitive global price. So we're seeing um, you know, negotiations of where price can go looking that way. And indeed, some of our firms successfully uh, selling their products into other markets um, already. So we'll continue to work with the UK make on how do we ensure resilience. Um, and as part of the long term strategy for PPE, uh, we do want to see a more resilient supply with greater UK manufacturing capability. You know, we all saw, again, back in March, April, the difficulty of securing internationally and the value of having that UK resilience. So I think, I think we're confident we can keep that going. You are right that whilst there are very large volumes of PPE currently manufactured and, you know, um, other countries also have significant uh, uh, PPE, we will need to work through how do we uh, ensure that the investments in the UK continue to work. And part of that will be bringing together the NHS demand. Um, in the work that we're taking to say what's the future of the NHS supply chain and how do we ensure that we have a, a better conversation with the NHS about what it needs overall and then how do we procure that um, and whether that can be helpful in securing um, UK manufacturing. Just one question, please, Chair. Uh, don't you expect other countries that had a PP shortfall to produce their own domestic supplies as well, though? And doesn't that mean that it'll be hard for our suppliers to... Um, uh, sell their uh, uh, PPE around the globe too? So I think it certainly uh, could be the case that we, there is an excess supply of PPE, oh, but, but let us, let's see. I mean, this pandemic is a long way from over. Um, and, you know, so I, I'm sort of slightly cautious on... Okay. Yeah, I think, I think that's... We, we used it. <laughs> that note of caution is, I, I think, very welcome. Can I just, just ask on the... We had some witnesses in from PPE suppliers. They were very clear that their focus was on high-end... Uh, PPE, not manufacturing the mass uh, stuff because they couldn't compete on price. But you've just said they can compete on price. So, just would you can, can you tell me specifically, you know, how many companies, which companies, just some some more further information about who is actually able yeah, to provide this cheaply in the UK? I'm happy to come back with the very detail. But certainly, the, the the work we've done with companies manufacturing masks, some of the other products. I mean, generally, it's capital investment. Um, and once you have the oil machines, then the actual costs of manufacturing here are, are no greater than in other countries. So we think that we have firms that are well placed to compete. Um, I'll happily come back with the details of the individuals. We've worked with over 30 
um, okay. and in we're just with, yeah, if you could, because we, I mean, we, we and other committees may want to pursue this because it's just we're getting very different messages. And obviously, yes. there's only a subset of people we had as witnesses. We can't speak to everybody, but that was just it's yes. just it jarred a bit. And the other thing but was so we mentioned. If they're gown manufacturers, then I would understand that that is one area where it's very difficult to compete in right. the UK. So when it's basic it's sewing, it's more expensive yeah, here. Is that very hard. Right. And okay. then the other area is gloves, where there just isn't the infrastructure here. So you know that yeah. would require a significant investment to bring gloves manufacturing. Which, as you know, is largely in relation. Yeah, well, I think we picked up on the gloves one before. Can I just ask us what you talked about to, in answer to Mr. Smith? The amount of PPE that you think might not be ever usable, um, whether it's converted into food trays or whatever, do you have a forecast or an estimate about what the final level of unusable medical PPE will be from what you've commissioned? So we're still we're still working through. So as as you know, we've taken the sort of quality assurance process really really seriously, and the way we've done that is as the materials have come in, we've had a sort of a, a first pass. And anything we've been not confident of, we've just held. So you'll have seen that with the materials we provided you in uh, Chris's letter and others, that, that the numbers in that do not supply um, stock are coming down as we are able to go back through the reason, um, um, look for uh, whether we have the, the right uh, certification testing to allow us to do them. So, for example, a significant block of masks, and um, we have now managed to pass uh, them for, there was a concern about that, uh, whether, um, what's the right word? Um, whether they might react with um, with skin. So just the, the actual, you know, their biosensitivity testing, uh, we didn't have confidence we had all the paperwork when we did the first pass. We've now got that agreed by the manufacturers and the regulators. Okay. So those have been released. Right. So, so you're when going it, through a rigorous process. So when do you yeah, think you will about, know? We're down to about yeah. 1.3 billion that we're still looking at. Yeah. Um, and, you know, over the next few months, we will be able to be absolutely clear of those. Okay. Of that 1.3, that's not used in the NHS. And that, that there's quite a broad set of categories there. So, for example, there'll be things that um, essentially the NHS don't want to use. So, um, I do aprons. We have aprons in boxes, perfectly legitimate, um, meet all the standards. The NHS don't like them in boxes, they like them on rolls because it's how they use them in the wards. So, some of the products that are not for the NHS, it's not that there's any kind of um, problem with the standards of the product, it's just not what they use. Gloves, um, the NHS prefers nitrile, we've got latex gloves. Um, so that's one set of things. Then we've got some others where actually uh, they were bought, for example, surgical gowns, which were bought, which you know obviously need to be sterile. So we have some of those that are not sterile, but could be used as isolation gowns. So some of it is about actually there's a different use from what's bought. Okay. So the, it's worth through each of those. Right. Well, so two. so when, when will you have got work through this? When will you have an idea of what's used? And I'm trying to categorise it. Some could be used for yeah, the medical settings. Well, look, we're continuing with through. We're now through the the main bulk of new stock coming in. Yeah. So we are accelerating okay. our way through the existing so stock. So I think over the next coming months we will have next coming months by stocks. the end of the year, by the end of the summer. Give us a staff, um, Mr. We'll Mayor. certainly update you by the end of the summer, and then let's see where we are then. Thank you. Um, we'll be, we're keen to, to learn that. Right. We now need to move on to the main discussion today after that, but that's very important to get to the bottom of those issues, particularly around care homes, discharges, which I know will be a, a long subject of discussion uh, as we go forward. But um, we want to now move on to uh, test and trace. And I just want to get some facts straight first, uh, Baroness Harding, about your role and when it began and ended. As we understand it, you left on the 20th of April this year. Is that right? Uh, not quite. Okay. Maybe, right. Perhaps you could just update us on, could, your, on yes. your dates then. Thank you. Nice. And I thought I would just also ought to start by just correcting something you said in oh. the introduction, mm -hmm. because I, I wasn't the accounting officer as a non-civil servant. So the Quindy, accounting of officer okay. for the vast majority of the time I was uh, executive chair of NHS Test and Trace was David Williams, the second permanent secretary, and then towards the end, Shona Dunn, who's, who's at the hearing. So just to, to be clear that the, uh, as there's always important... day-to-day, you were watching the budget and, and handling... I, I'm absolutely yeah. uh, comfortable taking yeah. you know, responsibility for the for the, for the leadership right, of the organisation, but, yeah. but mm. as we know, there's a specific technical yep. term of being accounting officer. So um, the the Prime Minister called and asked me to take on the role on the 7th of May 2020, um, and coincidentally, at my last day at NHS Test and Trace was the 7th of May this year. Uh, uh, Dr. Harris um, started at the beginning of April um, of this year, and we spent the month of April in a very very managed, coordinated handover. Okay, so so your responsibility completely finished on the seventh of May. That's okay. Great. But you, in the meantime, uh, so Dr. Harris was responsible. Who was the responsible owner of this uh, from during the April then? So operationally, I was still responsible. Um, clinically, Dr. Harris um, took increasing ownership um, of particularly, for example, the management of the Delta variant, and um, Shona Dunn was the accounting officer throughout. 
Fine. Okay, thank you. So uh, that's very helpful, to, uh, and thank you for the correction. So I'm going to ask Barry Gardner, MP, uh, to kick off on this issue. Mr Gardner, online. <laughs> thank you, Chair. And um, Baroness Hiring, let me, let me share a secret with you. The, the, the Chair has said to me that I must be nice to you at the beginning, so I, I think that means that um, she's got some really nasty questions lined up for you later on. Um, look, um, in the year that uh, you were the, the Chief Executive, there were two national lockdowns and more than four million confirmed cases. Given that Test and Trace was supposed to break the chain of transmission to get life back to normal, those figures don't really spell success. So my gentle question to you is, do you think you were given an unrealistic brief at the beginning to break that chain of transmission and get life back to normal? Um, well, firstly, thank you for being nice. Um, and uh, thank you, Chair, actually, for your kind words at the beginning of the introduction. Um, maybe if I could just start to, sort of in answering your question, Mr. Gardner, just to put some context. So the, the purpose and objective of NHS Test and Trace was to help break the chains of transmission as part of the overall COVID response. It was one, not the only tool um, that the government set out as um, its response to COVID. So you know, the non-pharmaceutical interventions, the restrictions, the MPIs that we have all had to live through, uh, the, the first element. Um, obviously, uh, NHS Test and Trace, the, the second. Um, the third, the vaccine uh, programme, and the fourth, the therapeutic treatments to um, help people um, cope with COVID better. So NHS Test and Trace was never set up to be the single solution to COVID. So I, I think it's important that we start with that context. Um, so then secondly, as the um, National Audit Office report sets out, and I, I say this with some trepidation because just as the discussion that the committee's just had about um, infections in care homes, the, the science is still you know, evolving as we learn exactly you know, how to evaluate all these different programmes. But as the NA report sets out, um, the, the, the evaluations uh, that exist to date suggest that NHS Test and Trace had a material impact in reducing the rate of infection. So the, the work um, quoted by the NAO, there are a number of different um, uh, uh, scientific groups that have been trying to model the impact of the order of 18 to 33% reduction in the infection rate due to testing, tracing, and isolation. I um, appreciate that's a very wide range, and as the report rightly points out, there are lots of assumptions, and there is a lot of ongoing work around the world to evaluate the effectiveness of these sorts of, of interventions. But and I would actually argue, and I, I do appreciate that a lot of people listening to this might find this rather incredulous given some of the way it's been reported, but I would actually argue that NHS Test and Trace has been a success, that it has delivered on the objective to help break the chains of transmission as set out in the NEO report. Well, um, I refer you back to the, the two national lockdowns and the more than four million confirmed cases. And if you think that Test and Trace has been a success, um, Mr. Gardner, um, could you just lean into your microphone a bit, please? We're yes, you certainly, of course. Um, uh, given the, the two national lockdowns and the four million plus confirmed cases, uh, you've correctly identified that Test and Trace was not on its own in uh, uh, seeking to break the chain of transmission. But that means that um, other areas, you would have to say, have failed in their objective. Um, in, if you are not allowing that there um, is any failure on test and trace. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure whether you're trying to shunt the blame off somewhere else by saying, well, we were only part of the picture and we've been successful. I, but let's look at exactly well, your so, so, particular... Sorry, area. Mr Gardner. I think I, I, Mr Gardner, can I ring in to Chris Walmart? Yes, I think I, I think I need to come in on this point. I mean, um, uh, Baroness Harding described this absolutely uh, correctly. Uh, the, uh, the government effectively has four pieces of weaponry uh, with which it fights COVID, one of which is NPIs, including lockdowns. Uh, to, uh, and we deploy, test and trace and contain, vaccines, uh, uh, therapeutics and uh, lockdowns. And that, and that is basically what we use to control the disease. Now, where you are completely right 
is the balance of um, how we use those four things in conjunction um, has, uh, has changed over the course of the uh, pandemic. And what we are seeking to do, um, as you know, is move away from reliance on legal NPIs uh, and move much more towards uh, uh, at the moment, vaccines and hopefully, uh, uh, in conjunction with vaccines going forward, improved um, treatments and therapeutics. So, I don't think it's possible to say there is this specific role for test and trace. It has evolved over the pandemic, and the important thing is how <coughs> is, is, is how those four things uh, uh, interact. Uh, so, of course, we've used NPIs. We've used them from from the beginning, and at times we have used them more intensively in response to how the um, disease was reacting at this. Uh, uh, point. That's a separate question uh, from uh, the effectiveness of test and trace within those four. And it's certainly not blame shunting uh, to say that we use all four of those and we use them in different combinations as we uh, Of course, uh, go it's forward. not blame shunting. You're absolutely right. Um, but there are 130,000 uh, people who have died. And if uh, Van der Sarding is saying that test and trace has been a success, then it implies that the failure is elsewhere. Um, so let's focus on test and trace. Um, for the tests to be effective in breaking the cycle, it's best that there be no more than 48 hours between identifying an index case and their contact self-isolating. Um, but my understanding is that you haven't always operated to that target. Uh, do you agree with the NMO that you need to speed up the process, including how quickly people actually book their tests once they notice symptoms? Um, I, I absolutely agree that speed is hugely important. And, and as um, the NA report sets out, over the course of the last year, we have got, we've learned a lot and we've got a lot better at turning around tests and contact tracing end to end. Um, I may defer in a second to Dr. Harris to, to describe the sort of clinical logic um, for why it's not a, a binary one zero thing of a certain date or turnaround time is good and anything beyond it is bad. Actually, the, the faster the system works, the better. The sooner um, we isolate if we are infectious or at risk of infection, the better. Um, now, the, the sage advice that we have worked to throughout has been clarified since uh, I last appeared before the committee to confirm that their um, target, operational target they set us, was that um, to, to, to go from test booking to contacts reached within a 48 to 72 hour turnaround. And um, on in-person tests, uh, we have been hitting the 72-hour target since January, and actually because we were hitting it, we increased the target to make it harder to drive further uh, performance improvement to 48 hours, which we hit in March of this year. That's not to say that we can't continually keep improving or that it's I'll, something I'll come, that the I'll team has to keep to working on. I'll come back to those in-person tests in, in a moment. Um, but my question was, do you agree with the NEO that you need to speed up the process of how quickly people actually book their tests okay. once they see symptoms? That was my question. Okay, I'm sorry. I miss, it's I miss about understood. how you're encouraging people the moment they feel symptoms to get the test. Yeah. I, mean, I, I agree that it's important that we encourage people and we work on the pro whole process end to end. I also agree um, with, with, with your statement that as we stand today, the single um, you know, biggest opportunity to um, continue to improve performance is people coming forward if they have mild symptoms and getting a test and making sure that then the process kicks off as fast as it possibly can. So, so what improvements have you made in that area? Yeah, it's, and how are you taking that forward to encourage the public the moment they're symptomatic to get the test? Yeah. Well, obviously, I, I finished in um, 
NHS Test and Trace two months ago, so I can talk up until May, and sure. then Dr. Harris can talk to for what's live now. But if you look back through the course of the last nine months, we've substantially expanded the number of testing sites to make it ever easier for people to get a test. So over a thousand face-to-face -face testing sites for symptomatic tests and a further thousand for um, asymptomatic testing. Um, we've worked with partners throughout the end-to-end um, -to -end journey to make it easier. So for example, for home tests, the, the Royal Mail um, now picks up from priority post boxes on a Sunday, and that's the, the first time they've done that for over 100 years. Uh, so we've worked with partners to make it easier and easier, whether you're face-to-face -face or, 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 or doing your test at home, to access it. We've done a, a huge amount of work with local authorities and community groups uh, and voluntary organisations to make testing accessible um, for people for whom English isn't their first language. So if you call 119, there are over 200 languages spoken. Um, the uh, test kits come in a variety of different languages, in Braille, um, uh, using British Sign Language. So we've made a huge amount of, of changes through the course of the last 12 months to make the system more accessible uh, and also to communicate and explain to people why, as I say, even if you only have mild symptoms, you should come forward. But I I'm two and months like, out sorry, of date. So. Yeah, sure. Uh, look, before we move on, um, you've given me a number of things that you've done. What I would ask is... Um, what, how did you quantify how quickly people were coming forward once symptomatic and how that has changed as a result of all of those things that you've done? Have you been able to say, this is where we were at a baseline, this is what we did, and as a result of what we did, we now know that people who are symptomatic are actually booking their tests more quickly and notifying us. Yeah, I mean, you, you hit upon something that is, is very hard to fully quantify because the, the only way really of being able to tell whether people are coming forward when they should is based on what they tell us. So we, we run a series of surveys, increasing surveys with the ONS to understand whether people are coming forward or not. And again, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be evasive. I'm genuinely two months out of date. And so important that you get the up-to-date view from, well, from Dr. Harris. Um, if I could just, I mean, there is an important point actually which overrides all of this, which is a third of cases will be asymptomatic. So um, for those individuals, uh, actually this is where the lateral flow comes in and asymptomatic testing, it's important because we are picking those up and they would not be coming forward because they will not have symptoms. So I think that's an important point. For the other two thirds of the cases, uh, exactly as uh, Baroness Harding has just said, uh, it is possible on retrospective surveys to ask individuals, but for many people in this room I know, self-reported surveys, particularly if they are post hoc, as in people are remembering back to where they first got them, are quite unreliable in some ways, that because uh, individuals will, I mean, as per, speaking on personal experience, I, I had anosmias, I know when I became anosmic, but for many people that is not uh, the situation. Just, um, I think we know what anosmic means, but do you want to just Sorry, when, when you get a, a loss of smell. Uh, taste or, or smell. Um, um, but for most people, actually, that is not their experience where they can say precisely at which time and on which day they did it. And in fact, once they have symptoms or once they have a positive test, their historic memory of when their symptoms started is quite challenging. So there, there is data, there are both uh, opportunities through the recording, uh, through contact tracing, but equally I think probably more importantly there are robust scientific studies focusing on individuals uh, trying to look at that. But it is a very, very complex picture and I think it's quite okay. difficult. I think the answer to your question actually is that the contribution, as Baroness Harding has said, to national communications, and I would argue a really important one is the increased engagement with uh, local authorities, with directors of public health, who actually know their communities and who will know how and how to focus messaging in a trusted way. Because I think this is not simply about communication, it's about trust in the system. And what we can definitely demonstrate, I think, from Baroness Harding's time and, and my own as well, is actually moving forward, liaising with local authorities and getting those messages through trusted leaders is well, often indeed, a good Dr. Way. Harrison, that's what many MPs were actually saying at the beginning, at the beginning of the process when uh, that message was not uh, implemented in the way it has subsequently been. But look, um, I want to pick up on 
what um, Baroness Harding was saying about uh, in-person tests, because um, my understanding is you don't have a target for end-to-end -end timeliness of home tests and tests in care homes, um, which are actually the majority of the PCR tests, aren't they? Um, well, well, actually we do, and we do monitor it just as closely. So the time frames I described for in-person tests, if I give you the, um, for, for all tests, by mid-January, 73% uh, of, of all tests were, um, sorry, from test through to contact identification, 73% um, were completed within 48 hours and 91% were completed within 72 hours. So we, we, we do monitor it. Um, you are absolutely right that it is, there is more work to do on home testing. It's one of the reasons why I point to the work we've done with the Royal Mail, who have been excellent partners in making it ever easier um, for people who can't get to a physical test site to get their home test um, back quickly and turned round. Um, but I wouldn't want you to think that we don't take home testing turnaround time seriously. We really do. I, I would say, though, that the, the, the substantial majority of positive Positive tests, positive test results do actually come through the in-person channel and that's because home testing is used for asymptomatic testing in care homes so there are far fewer positive tests that come through that um, and also used for our borders testing program and quarantine program again fewer a lower percentage positivity so so there is a logic for wanting to make sure that the in-person is absolutely hitting the, the targets. Thank you. Um, Initially, I believe you estimated that there would be about 15 to 20 contacts from, from each person who tested positive. Um, but actually, people only told you about three or four contacts, didn't they? Um, and that's basically their household members. Is it that people were embarrassed and didn't want to lose their friends by identifying them? Um, and how have you sought to overcome that problem? Um, I'll answer that in just a second. I just realised I've given you the wrong numbers. I'm very sorry. I gave you the in-person percentages, just for the record. Yes, please. The, the, you. All, PC, the all PCR within um, 72 hours is 75% and within 24, uh, 48 hours sorry, is 54%. But um, apologies for, for confusing the committee. Um, in terms of the number of contacts, uh, you're absolutely correct that when I arrived last May, the SAGE modelling upon which the government had decided to scale contact tracing was based on the assumption that in ordinary life you would have th circa 30 contacts, um, close contacts, uh, uh, as you go about your business. And um, that was one of the reasons why the contact tracing system was scaled to the level that it was during last May. And what we found from the very beginning of the launch of NHS Test and Trace was that coming out of lockdown, actually we weren't living in normal times and people weren't having that number of close contacts. And they were also, I think and suspect, heeding all of the clinical advice not to get within two metres of people um, who were not their close family that they were living with. And so we did see and have continued to see a much lower number, as you say. Uh, the, uh, uh, Dr Harris will have the up-to-date numbers, but much lower number of close contacts in part because of the other interventions in the government's approach to fighting COVID. Um, what we, we do see from the NHS COVID-19 app um, is that the app is able to identify contacts that you don't know you had. And so we do see more close contacts identified through the, the app, through digital contact tracing, than through um, individuals reporting their own close contacts. Um, only a minority of people who develop symptoms request a test. In fact, the report, the NEA report, suggests that older people, men, and poor income groups do not request a test, even though they recognise that they have symptoms. So, is it fair to say that Test and Trace is operating fairly well? for wealthier, middle-class, white women, but not really terribly well for anybody else. Well, I, I think that you hit upon one of the most important learnings um, from uh, the course of the last 12 months, um, which is that COVID-19 is an incredibly unfair and unequal disease. 
And I know that Dr. Harris and, and all uh, her colleagues in public health would say this is true of almost all infectious diseases, that they disproportionately affect the most vulnerable in society. Um, and I think it's probably one of the most important learnings um, for us as a country as we look back on the last year is how we target and tailor these services to genuinely work for the people who most need it. And, and Dr. Harris has referenced how important it is that we work closely with local authorities. As you know, that was one of the big priorities of the Test and Trace Business Plan published in December. It's one of the first things I did personally last May was appoint Tom Reardon, the Chief Executive of Leeds City Council, to my leadership team so that we could um, really work closely with local authorities. And, and, and I think, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, hindsight being a, a truly wonderful thing, um, you look back and say, you know, last May, um, the, the, the government strategy and indeed the WHO strategy as well was to build scale. You know, we were, we were told to, to, to test, 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 to build scale. Um, and over the course of the year, we have got better and better at supporting the most vulnerable and targeting our testing services towards them. Ben, I'm sorry. Ben, sorry. Uh, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, of course, that's right. But many people were saying this at the time in Parliament. But I don't want to refight that battle, okay? And um, what I want you to focus your answer on is um, how now the test and trace system can reach those people that the statistics in the NEO report show are not being reached. Yeah. The elderly, men, poor and Greeks. And um, that's the challenge. Um, it, it's a challenge that still faces the, the system, the test and trace system. Um, and it's really critical that if we're going to have a system that is fit, not just for, let's hope, the end of this pandemic, but for future pandemics, then we need to get over that challenge. Well, I would completely agree with you. Um, it's why the... Um, NHS Test and Trace Business Plan put working collaboratively in a team of teams with local authorities as the number one priority in December. And, and it is an ongoing um, programme of work. I, I think in terms of, as you rightly phrased the question, how do we continue to get better now? I do think Dr. Harry's is better placed to answer for, for now. Yeah, sure. Shall I contribute to that? So I think, number one, we need to understand the data. So we need to know who it is we need to reach. And that data is really, really good now. So we look routinely at both at the data which comes through from Test and Trace. Uh, it is, uh, goes through the Joint Biosecurity Centre. It's evaluated as well with Public Health England. And we look at, for example, cuts by age group, by ethnicity, by working group, uh, which by locality. <clears throat> and match up the testing data and particularly the immunisation data as well because often it is the communities who are also not coming forward or the particular groups not coming forward for uh, vaccination who are also not coming forward for testing and I think picking up some of the learning which we've, uh, Baroness Harding has described um, in some of the areas which we may go on to in the future where uh, we have looked at uh, surge testing for example in different communities um, actually working, putting the NHS and test and trace working alongside with directors of public health and pushing out those uh, the groups together has been very, very successful, as I've said previously, working with local leaders, whether it be local council leaders or particularly local faith leaders, for example. There, there is some difference in data, though, because there was actually another study which actually showed women uh, were, were not coming forward, so it does vary, and that's why the geography, uh, the age group, it will vary in but all of these different variables. So having the granularity of the data is really important, and I think that is an area, too, which has improved dramatically as we've gone forward um, and will continue to um, uh, under the Health Security Agency. And of course those demographics may actually cross in effect, so that the reason that women are not coming forward in some communities may well be because they're ethnic communities where, where that's, not, uh, that's not done in the same way. Um, Exactly. But there, there was actually a, an ethnicity study which was uh, an, uh, again in one of the SAGE subgroups by uh, Professor Kamlish Kunti who highlighted that in some uh, ethnic minority groups of uh, Indian heritage uh, women actually were more affected. So absolutely right, it needs the granularity of the understanding of the communities. So are you confident that you now have established the baselines for those underrepresented groups? and that you have targeted operations 
that are locally targeted, specifically targeted demographically and geographically, um, to actually change those baselines uh, and bring them up to what you would like to see as the target average. Um, I th yes, I mean, there will clearly always be more we can do, and we will continue to do that. But I think there have been a number of very specific interventions, again, as, as Baroness Harding has said, uh, in both, it's not just the written language, but in communications. It's who you're communicating with, it's how you're putting out your services in a sensitive way. Um, and, and actually also just practical things for, for example, for uh, disabled access for testing. If people feel they can't get to a test site and it doesn't work for them, that will soon spread and people won't go. And so we know we have net uh, promoter scores, for example, and there's, and there's no difference in the scores between those uh, who need uh, disability access and those who don't. So I think we are monitoring a lot of these areas, far more than we could ever have done to start with, and we'll continue and, and to. And finally, could I ask you to send to the committee uh, a range of baselines um, that you are focused upon so that you can tell us in a few months' time exactly the changes that have taken place in those numbers and the committee is able therefore to monitor it properly. Very happy to, just with a slight caveat at the start, which of course is we'll flow through all of this, the pandemic is changing hugely as we go forward and so the combination of rising and hopefully then falling rates and vaccination will mean some of that data before you've even got it, we will send it, uh, may be quite difficult to interpret. Well we're going to be touching on the future of course later, but thank you very much Mr Gardner uh, for now. Um, now we're going to turn to Sarah Olney MP online, Ms Olney. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Baroness Harding, at your previous appearance before this committee, we talked a bit about the importance of self-isolation uh, once, uh, uh, once contacts have been traced. Um, and you said on that occasion that that was sort of beyond the remit of test and trace in, in order to kind of uh, enforce the self-isolation or, or come up with the policies to encourage self-isolation. I wonder what progress has been made, uh, to your knowledge and other parts of government, to improve uh, self-isolation rates since then? I can answer briefly, but one of the things that has changed since I appeared before you last is that Jonathan Marin is the cross-government senior responsible officer for self-isolation. So really, I should pass most of that on to Jonathan. Mr Marin, thank you. Mr Marin. Hello, sorry, just, just coming off mute. So look, I think we've really significant work on trying to improve self-isolation. Um, I think the first thing I'd say is the monitoring um, that the ONS are doing now of um, self-isolation amongst positive uh, cases is, is really uh, strong. We're seeing over 80%, you know, 86% in the latest data of people saying that they fully meet the self-isolation requirements. And of contacts, even higher, 93% of the latest reported. So, so isolation of people who've had a test or have been contacted by test and trace is really uh, quite good indeed. Um, Mr. Gardner raised the, the wider data of people with symptoms, 43% uh, coming forward to have tests. So there's, as um, Baroness Harding has sort of about, trying to tackle that has been a major part of what we might do. Um, I would just add to Baroness Harding's answer. Of the people not coming forward, about 40% of them are essentially dismissing their symptoms. They don't think they're ill enough or they get better. So the, the message that Jenny was giving around make sure our communications are really clear about when to have a test is really important and will continue to be important. So in terms of trying to tackle um, improving isolation, three things that we've really tried to think about. One, the communications, um, making sure that people still realise it's important to get a test when they have symptoms. And I think that will continue to be an important part of our overall strategy. And again, as Jenny and Dadu have both talked about, getting that down to how do we work with local authorities to get targeted messages to particular communities is a really important part of doing this. You can't do all of it just from the sort of national headline messages. So that's part one. Um, making sure that it's easy to get a test, so the, the physical barriers are removed. Again, uh, Dad has spoke about over a thousand sites, 35,000 35, post boxes, um, uh, home testing, pharmacies being able to give kits. You know, we've really tried very hard that there isn't a physical barrier. So it's not that you can't get a test, um, and again, you know, we had some comments. Mr. Maron, sorry to interrupt. I've just sorry, uh, one, in the, I've got one more <laughs> that I want to talk about. And then the final bit, I think we try to work on, are there barriers to self-isolation? What is it that stops people? Which I think is the bit that then you can be most interested, where uh, we've gone for three significant things. One, we make really significant sums of money available to local government to pay support payments to people who need to self-isolate. So that comes in two parts. Um, 
The overall scheme, we've made £176 million available. The first £73 million of that is for the, the main national scheme, the test and trace support payment, which pays £500 to anybody who needs to self-isolate who's on a, a set of qualifying benefits. Uh, so, you know, people who are most at need. Given we've always understood that actually there are some people who face hardship but don't quite meet those criteria, we've made another £75 million available to local government to allow them to make discretionary payments to people facing hardship. So really significant sums of money now going into local authorities to help them uh, pay £500 payments so that people can afford to self-isolate. So that real concern that you know, our people are not isolating simply because they can't afford to, we've worked really hard to address. Um, obviously, that's a burden for local government to do it. It's a lot of work. So we've made £28 million available to local government actually just so they can run the scheme. So that you know, uh, we're trying to make sure we've taken that as well. Um, and then on practical support, from March, we've been running two schemes. One, a medicines scheme, so that if you need to get medicines while you're self-isolating and can't get you know, a friend, uh, a family member to do it for you, you can now contact your pharmacy and they can uh, find a volunteer or get somebody to you. That's £32 million pounds a month. Um, and we've provided £12.9 million pounds a month to local government to fund practical support. And we've been working with a range of local government colleagues um, particularly about 20 local authorities being very active in helping us in trying to just define what's good practice in practical support. Uh, where again, clearly, uh, knowledge of your community, on the ground, working out to work, how to do that is the most important bit. And then finally, because that's available everywhere, we've got um, a set of pilots now, another 12 million pounds to fund uh, a range of pilots, trying to look at what could we do further, um, and really in four blocks. I've got some uh, local authorities looking at intensive support. You know, do you need to buddy people up? What is it that some people need to really ensure self-isolation? We've got some pilots around crowded accommodation. You know, is it actually, it's hard to isolate because some people live um, in, in very crowded accommodation. Uh, a pilot working on the awareness of the need to isolate, which again, I think comes back to some of Mr. Gardner's questions earlier, how are we getting those messages across? Um, and a further set of pilots, a couple of pilots looking at speed, you know, other things we can do that really speed up those initial sets. So I think it's, you know, if we look at what we've done over the course of the pandemic and how we've learned, we've put in place really substantial funds to all local authorities to uh, make payments available for people on qualifying benefits, further funds for hardship payments at the local authorities' discretion, and then a set of practical support. And now really trying to learn from a set of pilots on, you know, are there more things that will drive a substantial increase in uptake of okay. both testing and isolation? Only. Thank you very much, Mr. Mann. I wonder, did the, did the funds that you're talking about, did they come out of the test and trace budget or did you have to lobby the Treasury for additional funds? The funds are agreed with the Treasury and they've come out of the test and trace budget. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to move on now to, um, to the new variant. Um, and I think this might be a question for Dr. Harries. So the new variant, the Delta variant, um, it obviously been in the country since about April. Um, my understanding is it now accounts for 99% of all positive cases of COVID that are currently being reported. Um, I wonder, Dr. Harries, um, how, how do you, why, we, we've talked earlier as well about the, the genomic work and that obviously helped us uh, to identify and track the Delta variant quickly, but why was it not more, why has Test and Trace not been more successful at stopping the Delta variant from spreading? Um, so I'm, I might start outside the UK actually, because if we look across Europe at the moment, even to places where we often quote as being highly successful, uh, for example Singapore, they also have a problem with the Delta variant and I would forecast uh, fairly robustly, I think, <coughs> over the, the next four to six weeks we will see uh, this variant cause huge uh, problems across Europe. You can see them just starting to tick up now. So I think one of the issues is uh, it, uh, it is highly transmissible, it is more transmissible than the Alpha variant and we saw a similar pattern, if you remember, that was the cause of our second wave uh, with a very sharp rise. That one, uh, you're quite right, we didn't have, that was the start, if you like, of understanding the importance of very early genomic detection. And we've gone on since then to develop uh, what we, uh, reflex assays, which are a sort of very general way of um, switching in testing to enable us to see which, which variants are causing the problem across across the UK uh, without necessarily having to wait for the detailed genomic testing to come back. So we have really good detection mechanisms now and we are, as you say, probably leading the world. I think in relation to this particular variant, it's difficult if you look at the South African one, for example, uh, we've been highly successful. Uh, we had uh, quite a number of pockets of the South African variant which were uh, brought into the country 
um, and they have been uh, stifled. Uh, lots of great work with local authorities, with test and trace. There are still a few cases around and we continue to monitor them, but it hasn't turned into uh, the sort of wave that we've seen with Delta variant. So I think transmissibility is a really important one. Um, and, uh, and there were some successes in controlling Delta as well, actually. Uh, the one I tend to refer to is, is Sefton, where we saw quite a sharp rise and then a fall. Um, Bolton, we often refer to as well, where uh, there was really brilliant work. I went there myself and saw uh, local authorities, local teams working on that. And, we, and certainly that has come up and come down more quickly. But it hasn't been uh, containable uh, right across the country. Um, but with the benefit of hindsight, once we knew that the Delta variant was in the country and we knew, I assume quite early on, that it was more transmissible, is there anything we could have done differently via the test and trace programme to have stopped it spreading quite as quickly as it did? So I think uh, my, my point of referring to other countries is because I think it's extremely difficult to do. Um, I think we did have some successes. Uh, the, one of the difficulties with variants is, um, and, and we talk about variants of concern and variants uh, under investigation, is because there are thousands of mutations ongoing. So I think there have been more than 4,000 mutations of this virus, and it will con continue to do that. We hope it will settle down in due course. Um, and so trying to work out which ones are of significance or not is quite difficult. If, if a mutation uh, signals that it has some sort of characteristic in the mutations which we think might signal a problem, uh, might be linked to other cases with higher transmissibility, uh, or might be uh, indicated could be a, a vaccine escapee, uh, then those ones we will be watching under investigation. But it takes some time between uh, to, to enable us to understand whether it is actually more transmissible for you you have to uh, it, it's almost as if by the time you've got there it doesn't matter whether it was the UK or anywhere else um, you uh, you need a significant number of cases to be able to be absolutely definitively sure what the char clinical characteristics are and transmissibility of the variant and it's one of the huge challenges of managing this because if if every time we had a mutation we shut everything down society would stop obviously we'd have done it 4,000 plus times just not realistic um, and so there is a gr gradated way if you like of of trying to manage this through variants under investigation and variants of concern and it is UK data which is often informing the rest of the world now so 40% of, of the GizAid uploads uh, show it of the genomic sequencing uh, globally is from the UK. So I think we did have some successes in many places, and some of those I've uh, highlighted. We had uh, enhanced response areas where we worked absolutely alongside um, local authorities. Yeah. Uh, we had the uh, armed forces actually helping with the logistics. Uh, we had work with local communities, and it has had success. But okay. the transmissibility is quite difficult uh, to control. Zombie. Thanks very much. I, I just um, on uh, so the, we know that restrictions are going to uh, be lifted on July the 19th, but we're not stopping the requirement for people to self-isolate when they're pinged by the app. This is causing some concern amongst the business community and in the NHS because if we've still got uh, very wide or you know rising cases, um, there's a there's a big risk that people will be pinged and have to self-isolate and the NHS in particular I think are concerned on the impact on their workforce they'll have lots of their staff having to self-isolate instead of being uh, instead of being at work it, what can the test and trace program do to try and address some of these workforce concerns uh, so just as a starting point two things number one the decision will be made on the 12th not yet I realize that might sound a technicality but it's very important given that the data is changing quite rapidly at the moment so that's number one and secondly uh, we still need to remember that if, if you are pinged or if you are a contact, you are at higher risk, even if you are double vaccinated, uh, of becoming a case if you're a close contact of somebody. So this is there for a purpose, not for annoyance. It's a public health management thing. Uh, but as the population becomes more vaccinated uh, and uh, we know that there's a significant improvement in uh, reduction in risk for those, uh, particularly the elderly, uh, of serious illness, hospitalisations and deaths, then obviously that move to reduce self-isolation is, is appropriate to, to get society back again. In relation to the health workforce, we have a piece of work actively ongoing with that, with other senior clinicians across the UK, uh, because you'll appreciate the, the clinical workforce, and I'd, I'd include the care workforce in that as well, for care homes, for reasons that we've said, 
it's really important that uh, where you have high rates of infection, society may be getting on otherwise outside, or it may be mostly in younger people, but hospitals will have people coming in who are infected. So really important that we look at that particular element really carefully. And then on the app, we are actively, again, have a piece of work ongoing at the moment, uh, because it's entirely possible to tune the app uh, to ensure that it's appropriate, if you like, to the risk. And of course, when the app came into action, and that was Baroness Harding's um, uh, uh, efforts at the start of that. We know uh, it's been hugely successful, but it's been utilised in a world where we did not have vaccinations. So actually working through what a vaccinated population using the app means is something that we're actively doing at the moment. Yeah, and if, 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 if I may just come in on that, because the two sides of your question there um, uh, exactly demonstrate why the judgments in these areas are so difficult. Uh, to, um, looked at from the perspective of variants, of course, you dial up all these various uh, uh, measures, as um, Dr. Harris was uh, describing. And the equal and opposite desire that everyone understands to reopen society and diminish some of the other uh, uh, detrimental impacts of our MPIs push you in the opposite direction. And, and these are the decisions that government and ministers have to take here, and there isn't an algorithm that tells you how to do it. So, and this is what Professor Whitty was describing at the uh, press conference uh, earlier. These are exceptionally difficult judgments where we have to, as it were, balance up exactly the concerns raised in your types, uh, in, in the two halves of your question, and come to what we think uh, is uh, uh, the greatest public interest uh, uh, approach. But I think we all should recognise that that will always push in two directions, yeah. depending on whether your question is how do we control the Delta variant or your question is how do we uh, minimise the disruption to people's lives and their wider health and the economy. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, back to you, Chair. Thank you very much, Ms Olney. <clears throat> I now want to turn to the money. Um, so I'm going to turn to Baroness Harding first as the person who was responsible for the money, but also Shona Dunn, stand by, because obviously as you were the, uh, you're the accounting officer, um, and then we'll, I'll come to Dr. Harry's uh, in a moment. But um, if we look at well, figure six uh, um, on page 33 in part two of the NEO report, lays out a very clear table, um, Baroness Harding, which I think gives me the basis for trying to understand what's happened. Because in November of last year, you, as the executive chair, led the bid to the Treasury for extra money to increase your budget from 10 billion for the financial year to 22 billion. And in January of this year, when we had evidence, there was that expectation was that that's, the spending would reach 21 billion by the end of the financial year. And yet we've seen a significant underspend, 39% underspend. So first of all, could you just give me what, the, the headlines on why you think that is? And then I want to go through some of the detail um, in this figure about why money hasn't been spent as expected. Of course. So there are three main reasons uh, for the underspend. Um, the first one, which accounts for circa £4.3 billion, is costs avoided because of activities that were cancelled as a result of um, the country going into the lockdown um, at the beginning of the year. The second uh, main area is uh, for £1.7 billion, activities that were moved from uh, the financial year 2021 into 2122, so delayed because of the decision to go into lockdown. And then the third large um, bucket is 2.2 billion pounds, which were commercial savings, where we were able to negotiate either lower rates or um, stop doing non-value-added non work with various partners. Okay, <clears throat> I mean, but it's a significant shift. So while it's a, it is an unpredictable there are elements of this that are unpredictable. Let's just go through the table here. Um, so testing obviously takes up the bulk of the budget for test and trace, as was as now part of um, the UK Health Security Agency. I'm puzzled, though, for example, why Pillar 1, the NHS swab, why the budget uh, was, was, nearly, it was nearly 50% less than that case. I mean, you know, that's a significant shift downwards what what happened there what happened with, why was nhs swabbing reduced so much as you say um the the vast majority of the budget for nhs test and trace is testing 
uh, no, uh, 70 to 80 percent. Um, and testing is a volume variable activity. So the cost is, is highly correlated with the number of tests, which in turn is a function of what's happening with both the disease and government policy. Okay, so we saw the country go into lockdown and the number of tests conducted drop dramatically. Oh, but even in the NHS, that's why I'm particularly yes. picking on the NHS, even yes. with NHS staff. Yes. Fewer NHS staff were being tested, even um, well, though they're going to work every the day. The Pillar 1 NHS swabs isn't NHS staff, okay. it's, it's um, predominantly uh, um, NHS patients. NHS pa pa fine. Okay, there will be fine. some NHS staff in there, um, but the regular asymptomatic testing of NHS staff will be in the, um, in the mass testing line. Right, okay, so they, that, but that's, well, that's good, that's gone out. So the, but the NHS swabs, so that's for patients doing, so that, well, that's, that dropped because outpatients dropped, presumably, then? Um, it, Largely, it would have been the testing I would have to give you. I would have to come back to you with all the full detail because okay. that cost is managed through the Pillar One team in the okay. NHS. I don't know if um, Shona Dunn has got more detail that um, she could provide. Ms Dunn? I, I don't have any more okay. detail than uh, okay. you do have, Baroness Harding. We'll absolutely come back uh, okay. with more. If we can come back. And then antibody testing. Um, I mean, perhaps you can explain the rationale for antibody testing um, for that budget of uh, 220 million but then only 36 uh, million was spent. Yes, so um, this is as the, uh, the science and the understanding of how um, immunity develops for COVID. So uh, it, when I first joined last May, there was great hope that antibody testing would provide a, uh, a means of accurately assessing whether or not you had immunity. And as we've all learned, and I'm clearly straying onto clinical territory here rather dangerously, that um, the behavior of your T cells is just as important as whether you do or don't have antibodies. And so the antibody testing budget has not been spent because the science has changed and um, it's not been able to be deployed in the way that people had originally thought. Dr. Harris, have you got anything yes, scientific? Al although to I would say going forward, actually, mm. antibody testing is likely to come back on its own because now we have um, uh, vaccines, of course. Uh, it's important that we understand who has had a good response, for example. So a clinically seen vulnerable individual who's immunosuppressed. Then, so we will see more of this. So there is, in, in the pure budgetary terms, I think it's probably better if we come back with the detail, but uh, absolutely recognise the scientific uh, approach, which was we didn't have sufficient tests to do. So what you're saying to me, uh, uh, simply, if I put it in simple terms, Baroness Harding, is that that 220 million set aside for antibody testing in... Uh, well, around when May, when you set up, it was set up then. It wasn't, and in November, even in, when you bid for more in November, that was still a budget line. Yes, and things have, have been moving. So, so it wasn't that you bid for more in November for that particular no. budget line. So that budget line stayed the same, but then you didn't need it because of the science. And, and let's be clear on all of this. Um, we agreed a funding envelope with the Treasury to make sure that the funds were available based on a, a range of different possible paths for the disease and government policy. Uh, uh, this is a sort of in some ways quite a strange conversation because what we've demonstrated is that NHS Test and Trace was able to adapt based on changes in government policy and changes in the disease and not spend money unnecessarily. And, and I think it's that's, a, very that's big, a good thing. I mean, but normally, with, well, this committee is always keen to see money saved. Normally, we would expect somebody running a budget this size to be, you know, much closer to what they predicted. I, I understand. This is, this, is, this is the biggest out of kilter budget no. I've ever seen in a decade on this committee. I understand, Chair, but these are not normal times. And and of all the things of NHS Test and Trace, it is an enormous new national citizen service that at the point at which we're we were discussing funding with the Treasury in November, the service was only six months old. In my experience of, uh, of a wide range of citizen services, um, your budgeting and forecasting gets better as you build evidence and data upon which to But forecast. you must have been fairly sure of, I mean, to ask for that extra uh, 12 billion pounds in November is a lot of taxpayers' money. Um, that was mainly for mass testing, of course, which did come in at a later date. But it just seems that, well, I mean, what was your, what, what, just can you walk through what sort of modelling you were doing that you could go to the Treasury with a convincing business case for such an increase and get the money from the Treasury? It would be interesting to know what the Treasury's reaction was when you didn't spend it all. And I'll come back to Ms Dunn on that. Well, we, we weren't modelling for a uh, national lockdown in, uh, at the beginning of the, the, the calendar year. 
and we were modelling for testing numbers to continue to grow and large-scale mass asymptomatic testing to be rolled out because people were going out and about us uh, in a more normal way. Uh, and, and we were also, just in the same way as Mr Marins described on PPE, modelling in such a way to ensure that we had the flexibility to adapt should the disease change its course or government policy change. You, you rightly pointed to some of the successes of the programme at the beginning of this hearing. We would not have been able to react um, to the, uh, the need to test hauliers at the border on you know, Christmas Eve without having flexibility in both resources and funding. What you've seen is that we've reacted both ways, that where we've needed to immediately put resources on the ground, we've had the flexibility to do that, but also where the disease has changed and we haven't needed to spend the money, we haven't spent it unnecessarily, and I think that's a, a sign of a well-managed budget in, an, in a crisis rather than something that is wrong. It feels like the taps were turned on regardless and that, that there's not been proper financial well, controls. Perhaps I go to Shona Dunn on this because overall... But may, may I just say first that, that, that what we're showing is a, a, a slide where the taps categorically weren't turned on. The potential to have the taps on was there, rightly, in case the disease went in a different yeah, but direction, a different, but, but we, in we White didn't Hall turn terms, the taps on. In Whitehall terms, I, and maybe, maybe Sir Chris or Shona Dunn will come back on this, but in Whitehall terms, there's contingency and there's a special money, but the, the Treasury can turn taps on if there is a crisis. So perhaps the lorry things. We recognise that capacity needs to be there, but you've had surplus capacity for much of this. So test tracers, for example, massively underused, 1% last summer, up to um, even less than 50%, even at peak, uh, 11 to 49%, I think is the more, more recent figure. So you've had that capacity paid and underused. You could have ramped that up potentially for the lorry drivers, but why was it that it was put into your budget and not there some discussion with the Treasury. Perhaps I'll ask them as done because well, it's more of a Whitehall issue and then I'll come back to Baroness Harding. Shona Dunn. So, uh, so Chair, exactly as you say, Treasury, of course, are um, very interested in the quality of our forecasting, very interested in our modelling and have a strong interest in making sure that as, as far as we um, can, we are coming in as close to uh, uh, the budget that we set. But, but Treasury colleagues uh, at the time, uh, David Williams was the accounting officer, but I think Treasury colleagues at the time absolutely recognised the exceptional circumstances that uh, Test and Trace were operating in. And the expectation at the time of both the substantial increase in PCR testing that was being modelled and the uh, mass asymptomatic testing plans that were being called together in November. And I think the uplift in November was from 15 billion to 22 billion. I think that 7 billion was specifically about those two things and an expectation that they would happen. And as Baroness Harding has said, through um, uh, December, January and into February, circumstances changed very, very substantially. Um, and that's why uh, a, a, a significant chunk of this money wasn't spent. And, and Treasury, uh, Treasury, we've had this conversation, I've had this conversation in the last few months since I have uh, uh, been here. Um, they understand the, uh, the circumstances that were faced. They understand the very rapidly changing uh, operational position and policy position. We've been through in uh, significant depth uh, where we have underspent um, to, to explain all of the different um, elements of that coming through. And we're talking to them about how we are using the learning uh, that, that the organisation has, has developed over recent months and the information that we now have, the data that we now have to improve okay. forecast modelling going forward. So how much of this was because the Prime Minister had stood up and said we want a moonshot? Marinus Harding. So well, I've just gone, if we go through the, the, the reasons for the underspend, there were a series of activities that were cancelled because of moving into lockdown. There were a series of activities that were delayed. But the Prime Minister made an announcement about having a moonshot, throwing money at it, didn't he? And that must that was then fall and fell to test and trace to well, deliver. If I could, yeah. if, let, let me just just take you through the three pieces. Um, the, the the mass testing, the universal offer for everyone to have um, access to two lateral flow tests a week, um, is the 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 1.7 billion that I referred to is the predominant is predominantly that that shifted from um, early in the year to after we we came out of the the full restrictions of lockdown. So. 
it's a, a timing issue. And, and, and can I just be clear? I was going to ask actually about that. Did that money get shifted from one financial year to the other? Because yes. you already had allocated money. For so the 1.7, I, I described three elements. So, so it just, it was... It was the 1.7 billion trans- pounds to be moved into, into Dr. Harris's budget for 21-22. And, you know, as we all now are able to access two tests a week as, as citizens. Okay, but so we, to be clear, that but that money was because the Prime Minister made an announcement about the moon. No, no, our plan, um, the, and as set out in the, the the government's winter plan and then the NHS Test and Trace business plan, was to roll out mass asymptomatic testing first to um, high risk. Uh, workplaces and then to all citizens, which is what we did, but we delayed the rollout of the universal offer to everyone because of the national lockdown. That's the reason for that that underspend in the year. Okay, I mean, I'm just, I'm, I remain concerned though that we have a, a budget underspend of, to th- of this magnitude. I mean, look at, let me just take another couple of areas of the spending. Um, uh, laboratories, which has been to some extent success, though we're going to touch on some of the challenges that, that uh, around that as well. But that was an underspend. Is that because fewer tests were going through laboratories? Yes. To be clear. So, okay. so the, the the good thing about um, l- laboratory testing, in fact, all of testing, is most of the costs are variable, and so we don't need to incur them unless we really need to use the tests, and that's what you've seen. And it's uh, it's odd to say relatively small in uh, comparison of, of, of millions of pounds, but innovation and partnerships uh, were increased uh, by three million pounds, which is small in the 37 billion allocated overall. Um, why, why was that? What's innovation and partnerships? Can you tell me what's involved? Um, that's the, the work continually looking at improving um, and working in partnership to develop new testing technologies and methodologies. So it's science and testing? Yes. Not, not with... So, so if you, we were, we, we've been one of the very first countries in the world to scale lateral flow testing. We've worked through the course of the last 12 months with a variety of different um, technologies to, to work through which tests could be more effective, more efficient, lower cost. That's, that's the R&D budget, if you like. Um, I'm going to bring in, I mean, so Chris Walmart's the accounting officer for the department as a whole. I mean, in your career in Whitehall, which is long and distinguished, so Chris, have you ever seen a budget so out of kilter? Um, no, and I've never dealt with a giant pandemic before either. Um, now, the um, uh, the approach that we have taken across government, and in fact we described in relation to PPE the last time I was uh, here, and the Treasury has been um, uh, our partner in this, we have not been um, uh, at loggerheads at all, um, has been uh, to ensure that we can deal with the worst of what can happen, both financially and in terms of the pandemic. Uh, it goes back to the answers that were given to Mr Smith on um, uh, our approach to PPE, which Jonathan described. Uh, we looked at a reasonable worst-case scenario bought for that, uh, which gives us a 90% chance of having too much, uh, by definition. Uh, we took the same approach to finances. Uh, to, so we were, and the Chancellor was clear right at the beginning, uh, that we uh, uh, would have the resources that we needed to tackle the pandemic and budgets were set uh, accordingly. Uh, we knew the risks uh, that there would be significant underspends. Uh, we didn't know they were going to be of the size you described, which were uh, drawn up for the reasons that uh, Baroness Harding uh, suggests. Uh, but all our discussions were on the basis of uh, we couldn't be in a position where we couldn't fight the disease for lack of resources or lack of approvals or those sorts of things. And those were the discussions that we had with the uh, uh, Treasury. Uh, so yes, it is unprecedented, but we're also in an unprecedented uh, okay. but, situation. But now, I do think, um, back to your core question, it is considerably better uh, to set a generous budget and then um, where we don't need to not spend okay. up to it. That is clearly well, better clearly, for the taxpayer. We're a committee that's always happy to see taxpayers' money saved. But however, yep. in January, only in January of yep. this year, we were told that this budget would hit £21 billion by the end of the financial year. And that was in January when we were going into lockdown. We'd had the Christmas issues. So that's a big shift in yes, a very a short shift, period and, um, of time. So how can, can you explain that? I'll come back to Baroness. Well, I mean, I think the Baroness has, um, uh, has explained it. it but, but the it, predictability con- of some of this was there in January, surely? Um, no, I didn't think that. Because we were in really, lockdown, we were moving into lockdown. Just, the modelling would have shown that you would I have I really don't think it was. The government hadn't made a decision to not roll out mass asymptomatic testing at the beginning of January, and my programme was still working to the government uh, a, a direction at the time, which was pr- to prepare to roll out mass asymptomatic testing to the whole population. That decision was taken through the period between January and March. 
So no, I don't think it was possible to have foreseen that. And operationally, it was important that we were able to respond to whatever those government policy decisions were and the course of the disease itself. But at that point in January, we knew schools had closed, we knew people were instructed to work at home again. So you, what were the discussions that were going on about mass well, testing well, between you and... and well, actually, and between um, Christmas and New Year, um, my team was rolling out asymptomatic testing into schools. So, you know, so actually, no, we were in full-on rollout of mass testing in early January rather than in slowing it down at that point. Okay, right. But, okay, well, okay. But, so Chris, on the same point. Uh, no, I'd agree with uh, what Baroness has just said. Okay, but this is money. I mean, one of the other concerning things, is, of course, is we want to see taxpayers' money saved, but that's because it can be spent whichever government's in power and it's somewhere else. So this is money that's been foregone for other parts of the, of the system. I mean, have, what conversations have you had with the Treasury about this? I mean, as a county officer for the department as a whole, have you had some uncomfortable moments as they've challenged um, you on no, this? No, as I say, we, 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 we and the Treasury have been um, clear partners uh, in this. I mean, uh, Shona's been having the uh, conversations uh, uh, recently. And this is emergency funding. No, this is not something that you can uh, you would normally reallocate to other purposes. Uh, it is, uh, as I understand it, uh, money the Treasury is raising specifically for this purpose. So I'm not, I'm not okay. absolutely sure. I mean, in, in a normal budget, you would be correct. Uh, but in something, and uh, I think Mar uh, Marius might want to confirm, um, in something which is being funded for an emergency, I don't think there is a reallocation uh, question. It would be a we wouldn't raise it question. Okay, um, Ms. Dunn, so you hadn't drawn it down, Ms. Dunn, is that right? Uh, uh, the funds are fully available to us. Yes, yeah, that's what uh, I thought. But the, uh, fully available to us. Um, uh, uh, and we have, as, as uh, Chris has said, been having those conversations um, in a very, very transparent way. And in, uh, in the Spirit Partnership, we have these conversations with the Treasury all the time. So wherever uh, information comes uh, to us, uh, we are very rapid in sharing that with Treasury. And uh, that's what the way we continue to run this. So, Ms. Dunn, did you consider sort of bidding for a, a, a window, a, a, you know, a, a certain a range of costs? I mean, when, the, when you were as a, as a county officer trying to make sure that this was held tightly to account for taxpayers. Uh, so, so the, um, the the discussions at the time. Uh, I wasn't personally involved in the discussions at the time, but the discussions at the time going to ne November uh, were focused on the test and trace business case at the time, the modelling that was done, the, the uh, demand modelling and the cost modelling that was done to support that was done very much with an eye, as Baroness Harding, Harding has said, to the, to, the, to the full range of circumstances we might meet and also to meet the peak requirements of those. So as both um, Chris and, uh, and Dido have said, we weren't, it, largely, we weren't um, judging needs to an average or to a central point at that point in time. Uh, we were making sure that we had whatever resources were necessary to deal with whatever circumstances we faced um, as rapidly as we possibly could. So certainly there were um, uh, models that gave us that range of figures, but the figures that we put forward to Treasury and were accepted helped us deal with that full range um, uh, right up to peak scenarios. Okay, so the Treasury knew about the range, the lower and the upper end, uh, uh, amount of what might be spent. So, so the, I, I was involved in the detailed conversations at the time, but I, they had full access to the information that uh, that Test and Trace were developing well, of course, based Mr. on. David cost Williams would have been would have been responsible at and that had, point. And yes, uh, uh, yes, uh, and he had. I know the Treasury had full access to all of the information coming from. Uh, test and trace and so understood the basis of those assessments. Okay and before I go to Dr Harris briefly on what some of the challenges are for this financial year um, I just wanted to ask about the Leamington Spa lab because obviously the labs is one potential element of prize from what comes out which we'll talk about a little more later but um, is it is it ready <coughs> yet is it completed and has that contributed to the underspend because it's been a bit late arriving? Um, so the Leamington Spa Lab is up and running and, uh, sorry, pass the baton over to Dr. Harris to give you a full up, update. Um, and, and you're absolutely correct that it is um, part of the future infrastructure that um, the country will have as a result of all this work. Um, the, like any other laboratory, the number of tests processed um, drives the cost. So there's been cost saved because there have been fewer tests processed. Um, but Dr. Harris, do you want to... So, so it, it's up and running and processing tests. It's not up to full capacity yet. That will come on over the next uh, few couple of months. Um, there so are, that's contributed to the underspend? Yes. As, as, one of, as part of the... Uh, 
that they've avoided through lockdown costs, possibly. You know. Yes, three billion. It, it, There'll be a relatively it, small contribution that, because it wasn't planned to be on it, uh, at large scale in 2021. Okay, it was, it was due on the line in June or May or June this year? Um, I think so it, it might have been in this financial year. Yes, okay, that's fine. correct. Um, Dr Harris. So I think you're asking about the longer term legacy. Yes, so the long, so, well, we, so we now see, we've got the, the questions that Ms Olney was asking about the Delta variant, so all well acknowledged, we don't need to go through those figures again, but we're going to have release you know, of lockdown a spreading variant, yes. lots of challenges for uh, test and trace, and lots of potential, well, how are you managing the cost and what's your projections on the cost given that you've got this large sum of money allocated? So, uh, listening to the conversation is extremely difficult and I was feeling for Baroness Harding because actually all of the data and the demand has been modelled against SAGE modelling effectively and uh, if many of you I know will have been watching that. And there is a high degree of uncertainty even with the best modelling. So when you then translate that through to uh, the logistics and the throughput of tests through a laboratory, it becomes extremely difficult. So just in the last week, we've had a 20% uplift in the number of cases that need uh, tests that need to be processed. So there is, hence, uh, you, some of your comments earlier about underutilisation of laboratories. It is actually important, firstly, to uh, understand that uh, labs need to be working safely. Uh, in our case, we, we, we recognise the 80% threshold. It, well, that's probably that's, yeah. 70% actually yeah. when, you, when you do that. And, and when they're peaking, which they are now, that means we need to bring on, we need to have thought several weeks back of bringing on new capacity, which we are doing. So we are stepping up that capacity in a uh, an approach which you know we can share uh, those predictions with you, uh, but it will never be. Uh, it's difficult to predict okay. with the precision that you. What's would want. the What's the window on the budget? Because you know, we, obviously the figures we're quoting, I should stress, are not audited figures, and that will come through in the department's accounts in, in due course. But what's What's your What's your expectation about the budget range and whether you, what target you will hit on the budget? Whether you'll be more within target than this forty well, percent? I think it's extremely year. difficult to say because the, it is driven by the number of tests which are going through. Um, and the tests actually cost different amounts. So we obviously, if we're using Lighthouse Labs, we're using uh, private additional procurement, and that will we'll use obviously the cheapest one first and then move on. It's extremely difficult to predict the cost going forward because we don't know when or what the peak will be. Um, but uh, You must have modelled for options. Given we're, what we're, mod so we're modelling the numbers mm -hmm. and then we procure the uh, additional testing uh, depending on what is available within the time frame. Okay, so even with all the Lighthouse Labs and the NHS's resources, you're having to commission new private lab support? Yes, that is part of the speak. plan step up. And of course, this is part of the challenge going forward of how do you plan for a pandemic when you need to pull on tens and tens of thousands of tests at very short notice. So there is a, there is a full model, uh, but, the, uh, but the costs will accrue depending on which services can be brought in at which times. Okay, last, last couple from me. One, one I just want to be clear. With test and trace, now Baroness Harding's gone, you're in charge of the UK <coughs> Health Security Agency, so who's in charge of test and trace right now? So I'm in charge of test and trace. The UK Health Security Agency comes into formal operational being from the 1st of October, and in terms of the budget, uh, Shona remains the accountable officer. Okay, so even though you'll be in charge of UK Health Security Agency, so it was done, you're in charge as a county, as a county so officer. I'll be the SRO overseeing oh. the, the finance. But, Sorry, Shona. But the finance um, is, is done with, with you, Ms Dunn. So I'm the uh, relevant accounting officer until the beginning of October. Okay, and you become accounting officer at that yes. point. So in terms of you're running test and trace yourself, but once the UK Health Security Agency comes in place, will you have somebody else looking at test and trace, or is that going to be one of your main? No, so te plans? test and trace. So the Health Security Agency will have in it the whole of test and trace, including the Joint Biosecurity yep. Centre, which has come in. Uh, it will have all of. So I've so just been clear. So in terms of day-to-day -day operations, you're going to be in charge of test yes. and trace from now for the what? what for you've got the, the job. foreseeable future. Yep. Okay. Right, so so it's rolled into everything. So you're you're the you're the main woman in charge of Absolutely. all of that. Um, okay, that's just helpful. Just my final question to you, Baroness Harding, before I pass to Mr. Clark. Um, the use of tracers. You have you've had you know we've, we won't go through the what we discussed last time about the low take up. Mr. Gardner touched on the numbers that you were expecting and then that you got. There were all sorts of issues there. Did you look at how you could flexibly recruit them so they could do other things? Because we understand from what the NEO have looked into that it was difficult to, to change their contract once you'd got them on, on space. There's, for example, we've had a lot of discussions about border security and checking at the border. We had a lot of people available and trained up. Um, so what's the flexibility within that team? Um, and if looking back, do you think you got it right and would you do it differently? 
Yes, um, it's, it's one of the things that um, the team, the, the commercial team, have been able to renegotiate in the course of the last year to give us more flexibility. Uh, so as, as we said right at the beginning, um, the SAGE modelling was for 30 contacts per person um, and we had to stand a service up in three weeks flat. And so there was limited flexibility initially. Um, we've since been able to renegotiate those contracts so that it is possible to both increase and decrease the, the numbers of contact tracers in the national teams far quicker. I, I would just, though, remind everyone, I know you know this, but it's, these are human beings we're talking about you know, who have, have employment rights, need to be trained. There will always be a yeah, My time point about lag. flexibility is if you've got... The NHS has bank staff, for example, that... Um, teenagers across London are working in the NHS on bank stuff, but there's a flexibility there where they're deployed where there is a vacancy. And, and that, yes. that many of the organisations which we'll touch on who do this, that's how they employ people, regardless of whether that's a... Uh, you know, we're not going to discuss the employment practices, but that happens. And, and that's absolutely correct. And those sorts of flexible arrangements are now in place. So, for example, for our call centre staff, over a four-week period, we can now flex up to 50% up or down, and over an eight-week period, up to 100% up can or down. And they be redeployed to um, other areas if, if yeah. you had to send them to the border? Yes, I, and, and, and the, the um, border policy has meant actually much more work for people you know, from their living rooms and, and kitchens calling, and, and the teams have been able to flex across the whole of the contact tracing and and quarantine services i would just say though the speed at which the virus changes and therefore the importance of having spare capacity makes this a very unique situation so you saw in december yeah. we went you know the, the the volume of people needing to be reached we, by we our contact tra hearing, traces yeah. Yeah. grew by yeah. fourfold over the space of three weeks and then fell again by 85 percent over the following so, three so, weeks so my final question was were you having any discussions you had a hot, hot line to number 10 you were appointed directly by the prime minister did you discuss anything around border uh, control and what test and trace could do and what these traces could do at the border when you took over or over the summer um, last summer no i was not involved in border discussions last summer personally okay you didn't so you had no discussions at all personally i was not involved in border okay. discussions did anyone in test summer. and trace have those discussions um, you can, i mean obviously that's not a trick question because you no. might have been somebody somewhere but i, I mean not that yes. you know of yet, no. given that uh, it wasn't that you deputed at peak there were fifty five thousand okay. people working in test and trace right. i'm not but sure you hadn't deputed can... somebody to go to that. No. no okay that's just really right. no. mr clark uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Chair. Just one question to Baroness uh, Harding. You've clearly learned a lot during the, your year in post. Why did you leave on the 7th of May rather than later in the pandemic, perhaps when the, the new organisation was going to be created in the autumn? Uh, well, one of the things I said last September when um, the national, what was uh, provisionally called the National Institute of Health Protection was, was set up was that um, I intended to help recruit a permanent chief executive and chair and that I didn't intend to be either of those two people. Um, so I left at the point at which a chief executive and chair were appointed and a sensible managed handover had been completed. I mean, Dr. Harris is very experienced throughout the, the pandemic, but, um, but you specifically on test and trace, aren't there experiences that you could have brought to, to bear for a few more months? Well, I spent a month working hand in hand with, with Jenny, um, which in the total life of NHS test and trace is actually quite a large proportion of its life. Um, I'm also still here, as you notice, um, two months after I've left, and you know, I, I've, I'm incredibly proud and view it as a huge privilege to have served in the COVID response. And I'm always there if Jenny and Ian Peters, the chair, need any help or advice. Thank you. I mean, there is a question of continuity. And we've, when you've appeared before my committee, we've been concerned that some of the, the directors, the director of testing and the director of tracing, they've changed in some cases several times within the last year, which hasn't been helpful. Uh, but um, let's perhaps uh, leave, that, leave that for another day. And I've got a question to Dr. Harris about the app. You, you mentioned a couple of things about the, uh, the app. Uh, in the, the National Audit Office report, they say at the week commencing the 22nd of April, 16 million people uh, had the app fully or partially enabled. Can you bring us up to date with what the latest figure is? So I think it's over 25 million, um, but uh, people will, obviously that number will, will vary as, as time goes on. And I do think actually it's important just at the moment to remind people how important it is to keep, keep the app running. It's, a, it's an advisory uh, uh, piece of information in terms of managing the pandemic. Are you sure that, that is 
be fully or partially enabled rather will, than download I, it? I believe that is the case, but I will uh, get a number for you for today. Okay. This is clearly very important, and it's, uh, the, you, you mentioned it uh, earlier. There is some concern about the, the role of the app, and in particular this extension by a month f beyond the 19th of July uh, of people needing to isolate. There are some suggestions that people might be uh, either deleting it or, uh, or stopping it being enabled. I assume you're keeping an eye on this. Uh, are you? Are you? And you must have real, literally. Real, one of the good things about technology is, every minute you can tell what the the number of uh, downloads and enabling is. What, what is the what is the what is the trend? I don't have that figure with you, but we will get that for you. But the key the key point I think that you're making is, I, I, and I would like to just challenge this word of the extension of of the contact tracing because in fact what's happened is we're not ceasing isolation. Right. It's continuation of an intervention for a particular reason to that point. And the point is that when we get into the middle, particularly the end of August, we hope that we will start to see a turn in that peak, that we will have nearly 75% of the adult population doubly vaccinated, which gives a completely different degree of protection to the one that we have at the moment. I understand that. I think a lot of people in the country, when they heard the Prime Minister talk about the terminus date, reasonably expected that might extend to the need to isolate uh, in receipt of a message from the app as well. But do, you may not have the exact figure. Are you aware of whether there is a reduction in the number just in the last few days of yes. people with the app enabled? I, I am aware that uh, people are choosing not to use the app, hence my uh, point at the start, which is it is very important. And I think it's important for two reasons. Firstly, the one I've just given, which is we're seeing a rise in cases. So this is not an inconvenience. It's actually uh, to alert people to the fact that they have been in close contact and they may be at risk of becoming infected themselves and passing that infection on to other people. Uh, the second one is that it's, uh, it's good to have that there uh, for advisory uh, reasons. We can pass information to people. It's the quickest way. It's 15 minutes to get information to people. It's often uh, the easiest way in some areas. So, for example, large numbers of cases in younger people, in young adults, often uh, in hospitality settings, for example, in the cases where you wouldn't necessarily be able to contact trace easily. So there's some very good reasons why you might want to keep that app running. Uh, and we know, as I think uh, Baroness Harding said earlier, we, uh, we know that uh, up to about, it's difficult for the numbers which she said, but uh, 500,000 uh, cases have uh, been detected that way and transmission uh, chains uh, ceased. But you, I think you've hinted that there are going to be some changes to that, and they presumably reflect the fact that the context changes. If, if someone has been double jabbed, then they will feel, perhaps not unreasonably, um, that the, uh, the, the, the threat is less than during the, the raging height of the pandemic in which very... Uh, very little of the population. So, um, uh, so this goes back to um, public perception and the whole of the test and trace service and, and all the different parts of it are um, a need uh, the public and the system to work with them. It's the same for the whole of the pandemic response actually, all of this, the uh, um, non-pharmaceutical in interventions so, uh, and social distancing. It, it is a partnership to support the population to get through the pandemic. I understand that. And it comes, back, I mean, it comes back to my point about the balancing of the four pieces of weaponry that we have. Yes. Uh, so you are completely correct um, as as one of those pieces of weaponry expands, as Jenny's uh, uh, described, uh, we of course keep under review how we use the other three. Um, and, um, and therapeutics, as they increasingly play a part, will uh, 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 do likewise. And that's why we were able to take some of the decisions that we did. Well, I was interested in what you said, uh, Sir Chris, on that, uh, that balance there. Um, and clearly there is a balance. There are two yep. sides of the uh, equation. Um, and there is the, the isolation um, that is imposed on people, extended uh, for another month, including people that are jabbed, versus the impact on hospital admissions. Yeah. Obviously, as the Permanent Secretary, you, you must be familiar with that uh, data. So, of the, what, are you, what are your estimates of the number of people that will be required to isolate it as a result of extending 
um, the isolation requirements until the 16th. Sorry, August. it's not um, as, uh, as Dr. Harris described. This, this is a continuation of the Correct, existing absolutely. policy yeah. to a. So, uh, so for that month, I don't, from I, the 19th I don't have, July that, I don't have that exact number uh, uh, with me. But, um, but the point is that as vaccination rises over that period, we are able. Uh, uh, turn off some of our other interventions. Yeah, but you've described uh, yeah. making a balance, and if you're making a balance, you you, you read yeah. the, so I, the, I, the scales. So I, I don't have the specific number you're after with me. If we'll I check. come in on that one. I mean, yes. at the moment, the cases yesterday were around 33,000, and I, uh, on Wednesdays, they're sometimes slightly different, but they are rising. So uh, it will change on a day-to-day -day basis, depending on the steepness of the curve, what the estimate of the number of contacts is. When but the Health Secretary talked about 100,000, is that a figure that... I think that was a, pe a potential... You reckon peak nice. figure right. um, as I said and I know some people are quoting five th five million mm. um, contacts but of course if you actually work you can work out what you think it might be for each each stage of the cycle what's your central estimate well <laughs> it depends where you think this peak is going to be but if you say for every uh, two but there are 2.4 contacts on average which was the question we had earlier 2.4 to three contacts for for every uh, new case uh, but then you have to assume how many people are using the app to take that through, and that will depend on uh, it's a different age group. So it's a very difficult one to do because you'll have a changing age prevalence on a day-to-day -day basis as well. Of course, but you must to make a judgment. You must have a, a feeling for how many people, an estimate more than a feeling, an estimate for uh, how many people are going to need to uh, isolate as a result of that to compare, which we understand is the the logic against the increase in hospital admissions that if you didn't do that. So it's, I think the other point is about, as I've said, this is, an, this is an extension of existing policy and the decision around that policy end happens next Monday. And one of the reasons for the extension is partly for the vaccine coverage, uh, because that will also impact the, um, the number of people who will become positive as we go forward. So as the vaccine rate is changing, uh, the, uh, in the the risk of somebody becoming an infected right. contact also changes. This d Prime Minister and uh, many others have said it's data, not date. So, what is the data? So it's, well, you could work. It depends on how many people have the vaccine as we go forward over that period. So, an assessment but has been made, to, as Sir Chris said, to whether it's delay or, or not, not um, remove the requirement for isolation by a month. Quite apart from modelling every day on everything, the issue here is we are still monitoring the hospital admissions because I'm sure you will have seen that hospital admissions, whilst much lower than they have been, have started to rise. And so actually, rather than be calculating that day, the bit that is really, really important is whether our hospitals are going to fill and whether we are going to have deaths. Completely understand that. And, um, and obviously, it's, a, it's an important equation to, uh, to, to balance. But I think the implication of it being about data is that we get to see the data and, and be able to scrutinise it as parliamentarians. But let me ask, uh, we've got a number of things to talk about. Uh, just in terms of the, the NAO report um, on lateral flow tests, um, the National Audit Office said that NHS Test and Trace forecast that by the end of May 2021, uh, 655 million tests would be used. Well, do you have an est estimate of how many have been used? So uh, we don't, and you'll see from the report that the uh, the registered test is 14%. If you actually take out the numbers of tests which we know are, if you like, in transit or in store, um, that figure rises to 20%. But uh, surveys suggest that more than 40% of people are, are using the test there, and uh, it's difficult to estimate beyond that. One of the points about the use of the test has been it's a new technology. We have pushed it out clearly earlier uh, before I joined Test and Trace, but we've absolutely pushed out the tests at a time, uh, partly, as we discussed before, to cover those very uh, high-risk settings like care homes. Um, and as time has gone on in order to understand better what the utilisation is and be clear about the value of utilisation, uh, we're turning over into a pull mechanism so we can be really clear. The other thing that we've been doing is putting in uh, much tighter um, uh, logistics, if you like, practice, so that as you uh, pull through the system or as we deliver to a home, you can see how many of those tests are coming back and being registered. 
But at the end of the day, we, we know that many people are using them and not registering them. Uh, it's very difficult then beyond that to know. We can tell you how many have gone into each setting, for example, into each channel, whether it be schools uh, or care homes. I think my colleague Sarah Olney might have some uh, further questions on that. And just uh, uh, finally for me, perhaps to Baroness uh, Harding. Um, uh, as has been said, we have uh, people testing positive for COVID. I think um, yesterday there were... Uh, there were over 30,000 people testing positive, uh, up from 5,000 at the beginning of June, uh, increasing exponentially. Now, in autumn of last year, um, you made a business case for the extra funding that we've talked about, um, that it would be used to prevent a second lockdown. It's pretty evident, is it not, that were it not for the success and effectiveness of the vaccines, we'd now be in uh, another lockdown. Um, has that revealed that the, the aspiration for test and trace to prevent lockdowns uh, has evaporated? Well, I think this just takes us back to what um, the, um, Sir Chris was saying and I said at the beginning, which was test and trace has always been one of four main planks of our COVID response, not the single one. So, so no, I'm afraid I don't recognise the, the way you describe that. I mean, to, to quote from your business plan, NHS Test and Trace aims to avoid the need uh, for a second national lockdown. Are we play, were we placing too much weight on the as a, potential for Test and Trace if, to avoid that? If we, the, your, the NEA report itself mm -hmm. um, sets out that Test and Trace's objective is to help break the chains of transmission. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, obviously, we would all he hope that um, of the four interventions, um, frustrating and different, difficult it is for individuals to isolate, it is clearly less damaging for the population as a whole than, than large lockdowns. Um, but large lockdowns is one of the four tools that we have to, have to, to, to use as a, as a country, as the government has to use. Okay. Was it just a bit over-optimistic of you to, put, I mean, to have it put in the business case is quite a gung-ho approach? I, I think that, again, look, it's sort of two months since I was in the thick of it, as it were, and to sort of step back with just a bit of distance. And you can understand why, this time last year, uh, no one thought that vaccines would be deliverable. No, no, that's in, not, no let, let me, let me yeah. I will get there. No one thought the vaccines would be deliverable. I think it's, it's not actually that surprising that the whole country wanted to believe um, that we could beat COVID without having to do the incredibly unnatural, difficult things of, of lockdowns. So I think it's not just about... Who put it in the business case? Was that your decision or was that driven through number 10? Um, to, to be well, I, I refer back to the business plan that were published, yep. which is really clear that our, the test and trace role was to help break the chains of transmission. Okay, but the bid for the money was that it would break, it would avoid a, a lockdown. Well, I, I don't actually think that that's the essence of anything that I've ever said. I've, no, I've been to this committee before and to many other select committees and said again and again and again that test and trace is one of the elements of, uh, of tackling COVID. It was never set up to be the single-handed um, uh, tool and n never could be. And if you look it's at every country control. in the world, that is the case. What it did say. Procedure is important here. Th this was in the business case that requested... Uh, a, an eye-watering sum of public money, and it was justified uh, on the basis, I'm quoting from the uh, NAO, um, that it uh, aims to avoid the need for a second national lockdown. Um, that, it, that was uh, an important contributor to getting the money. So I think it is reasonable, especially for the Public Accounts Committee, to to reflect and to, to ask whether that was an accurate and, representation that had been made. And all I'm just saying, Mr Clark, is that the government policy was that test and trace was one of the elements, not the only element. I don't believe that the Treasury believed that test and trace was the single-handed reason um, that we would uh, fight COVID. Who owns the business case? Was it you or was it shown and done in the department? Just to be clear, that, that signed up to bid bidding to the Treasury on the basis that Mr Clark's oh. just outlined. So, Chair, the, the, the business case would have been uh, the business case will have been put forward by the department. Um, uh, the business case will have come forward from Test and Trace. It will have been considered um, uh, by. So, who uh, signed off that wording then? If it was, if it was one of four, was it, why wasn't uh, they, it described they, as one of four? 
things. The, um, the, the business case will have been signed off by the accounting officer at the time. David, I'm absolutely certain, as Baroness Harling said, that the Treasury was under no doubt whatsoever that Test and Trace was only one element of the response and would not in at any point have thought that there was a suggestion that they were the, the sole answer to avoiding a, a further lockdown. OK, well, we refer everyone to the National Audit Office report, which highlights the facts on that. But uh, I'm going to go to Nick Smith, MP, Mr Smith. Uh, thank you, Chair. And, and shortly I'll go on to the issue of consultants. But I want to take a quick um, deep dive into a little bit of the detail of the report. On page 47, figure 17, um, uh, for the period uh, between March and 1st of April, there's a... a a big dip in the test taken and um, I just wondered uh, Baroness Harding if you please give us an explanation of that is it a data thing is it an ops thing is it some other that's issue? the school Easter holidays so it's straight Easter holidays yes so just looking at it eyeballing it this is it's a reduction in a uh, substantial reduction in lateral flow testing um, and we know that in the first um, during the, the when schools went back at the beginning of March, they did an outstanding job at yeah. testing. Um, not unsurprisingly, once our teenagers um, went back um, home for the holidays, we saw a dip in the testing volumes that then came back up again when schools went back. Okay. All right. Any, anybody else? That's pretty okay. obvious. Okay. Thanks, uh, Chair. Um, now, turning this vexed issue of uh, use of consultants. Um, uh, it seems that um, they are uh, over 50% of the uh, uh, staff total at the uh, central office, uh, close to more than 2,000 people. Um, they've got very high day rates. Uh, some of them will earn, or would have earned over £200,000 this past year, some £300,000. Uh, um, we just need to dive into this a bit more. Uh, Baroness Harding, um, why are the numbers of consultants employed by NHS Test and Trace higher in April than they were in December, just despite your plans to reduce them, please? Yeah, sure. Um, firstly, I, I don't recognise the sums of money that you've just described for individuals' earnings. I think we have to be careful that we're not just multiplying by assuming that people are working uh, uh, the, the whole time. Um, in terms of... So what would you say? The highest I, do, I don't have a figure I'm afraid because I think there does need to be clarity by this would you let uh, us know how well, much Dr Harris will have to now I'm, yes I'm afraid I okay. can't but right. I, I refer maybe to Shona Dunn could describe what is and isn't possible how many of those consultants uh, uh, Shona will have earned over 200,000 pounds since March of last year uh, so we, uh, I don't have the figures for individual consultants in front of me. I think we have um, uh, issued information which says that the uh, average day rate for our consultants and contracts have been £1,100. Um, and the, the NA report and other sources cover the spend on our top consultants' uh, contracts. Um, so uh, it, uh, undoubtedly there will have been uh, a number of consultants, no doubt, that had um, higher than £1,100 day rates, but I don't have that information blow by blow in front of me. Um, I'm happy to consider, Chair, what we can share with the committee, yeah. but obviously you'll understand the, um, uh, the personal... Well, I appreciate, Ms Dunn, just I'll just chip in there, that it might be uh, commercially confidential, but we, if we could have a reading room approach to seeing some of that information, we've done that with other departments um, and a lot on Brexit, and we obviously never leak anything, so if we could do that, that would be great. Uh, happy to talk to the, to the clerks about what we can provide in that context, Chair. Of course. At the back of the envelope, uh, count up for the last year on a thousand pound a day uh, would very quickly add up to over 150,000, up to 200,000 a year for some of these 2,000 people. I'm sure. Can you can you write us about how many people have earned more than 150,000 or 200,000 or 250,000 out of those 2,000 people in the last year, please? 
uh, Sue, I will uh, I will talk to the team about the the granularity of the data we hold, and uh, absolutely, um, as the chair has asked, um, talk about what information we can share respecting uh, individual confidentiality. Yeah, we wouldn't and want to. No, we, we have a well worn route for doing this. Yeah. done, so we'll, we will. I know, we will, and absolutely, yeah. we will. We'll go we to will, back will, channels we'll, to sort that out. Thank you, Mr. We'll, Mr. Smith. We'll sort that out. And we wouldn't want to break any confidentiality, but do you know what? It can't be that hard. Yeah, we know we have a well known yeah. route, so that's okay. Cool. okay. Um, so back to my question, Banis Harding. Uh, why are the numbers of consultants employed by the organisation uh, higher in April than they were in December in 2020? Well, maybe I could just start by saying they are lower today than they were in April. Yeah. Um, so today, consultants make up could, about. So to come back to the crest. Okay, yeah. sorry. I just wanted to give you that full context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so. Um, you have to remember how much, and we've just been discussing it in the context of money, how much um, things have been changing and how it, important it is that um, NHS Test and Trace is able to react very quickly. So we have had a plan in place since uh, January with named SROs for each of the consultants to roll consultants off and replace with uh, permanent civil servants. Um, that process is not easy, if we're really honest. So um, we've run, up until the end of May, um, 523 recruitment campaigns to fill uh, 1,894 roles. Of those 523 campaigns, 196 of them, 37% have failed to appoint anyone. Um, and those have particularly been in data, digital, operational and project delivery roles, all of which are skills that are in very scarce supply in the civil service in general, um, but actually in the economy as a whole. Um, and as, as Mr. Clark was asking about me personally, but uh, others, it's really important that we don't just focus on removing the consultants. It's, we need actually the permanent civil servants in role. And in all honesty, that has actually been quite hard to do. Um, at the same time, the demands of the programme are changing. Um, so, you know, I don't want to be <laughs> hand the problem to Dr. Harris as, as, as the government's um, policy is changing, that in turn right now will be changing the requirements. And, and as Jenny and her team are forming UKHSA, it's important that we're only making permanent appointments through proper due process. Um, and it's only gradually becoming clear in some areas what, a, what the permanent structure should be. So the, this is a very long-winded answer to say, um, I don't think anyone wants the, a service that's this important to be dependent on temporary resources. Nothing it's against half, it's the- It's over half the staff. Yeah, so no yeah. one, well, it's 40% now, so it's going in the right direction. Um, no one wants the service to be dependent on temporary resource, however good those individuals are and however committed they are. Um, but it's also important that we make the transition in a measured and sensible way. And we recognize that some of these skills are skills that don't exist in in the civil service and we need to bring them in. Okay, as you've had to lay off more expensive consultants, how have you, and brought in uh, better value, cheaper consultants, how have you retained the knowledge from the, uh, um, the earlier, more expensive consultants to make sure that, I mean, I know the job's changing a little, but still, there will be important knowledge, organisational knowledge, that will need to be kept. Well, and, and this is, your question sort of implies the answer, and really. this is the absolute challenge of managing this roll-off of consultants. So over the course of four and a half months, 17% of the consultants have rolled off, which in, in any other you know, public service would be a very, very large change that you'd say you don't want to push it too much faster. So it's important that you manage this in a staged way, that there are handovers, that you, know, that you parallel run with people, um, and that we're really thoughtful about the skills transfer. And, and I have to say, I, I, you know, I do understand the committee's concern about this, but I think it's also important to recognise you know, the public service that all these individuals are doing. I think they've all cared deeply about making sure that that knowledge transfer really happens and that people are available to those permanent appointees once they come on board, to, you know, even after they've left. And we've seen fantastic um, public service from those teams across the board. I'm just trying to understand it a bit more, just because I'm a little bit afraid that things have got out of hand in terms of um, consultancy, consultancy expenditure, because you've estimated you'll have a total consultancy spend of £195 million, 
but the indications are that you're going to spend 300 million on the top 10 consultancy suppliers alone. So I'm, I'm looking for sort of, you know, more confidence that you're prob probably gripping this really. I mean, paint a picture of what these 2,000 people Maybe, are doing. Could I possibly hand that over to, to Dr. Harris and to Shona Dunn, given that you're asking about the now as opposed to where we were well, two months just, ago? Uh, what know, are they doing? A lot of this did begin under you. Will you tell us what you thought those 2,000 people... Tell us more about the two... Paint a picture. What okay, those 2, I paint a picture. Well, as I said, uh, you, you can see it from the skills that have been harder to, to recruit yeah. into. The, the digital, the data, the operational project management skills. A lot of these are skills that in the wider economy, both in the public sector and the private sector, are done by people working on more short-term consultancy-type arrangements. The, you know, the IT sector is one that works like that. Um, and so it has been necessary to bring in people with those sorts of skills who are used to coming in and working only on a project. So, and as uh, the, the disease has changed and government policy has changed, it's been necessary to mobilise teams at very, very short notice where you can't give individuals clarity on how long the job is going to exist. So by definition, you have to make it a short-term appointment. So if I give you an example for that, um, the, um, the very rapid changes in um, which Shona Dunn was leading on border policy required us to stand up a borders team very, very quickly. In inevitably, that meant you had to bring in contingent labour. So, you know, short-term labour both, and we've used through the course of the last year, temporary contingent labour from all parts of society, whether it's been the army initially, um, the civil service people on secondments, we've had a lot of volunteers who've come, people who've been between jobs have come on, uh, on volunteer contracts, uh, unpaid. We've had, and then we've also had consultants who've been paid, as per, that's part of the, what they do in, in, in normal times. So we've had to fill those short-term skill gaps partly because some of the skills just didn't exist in the civil service and partly because we couldn't say to someone here's a permanent job and I think the committee would quite rightly be very critical of me if I was sitting here now saying we had a lot of permanent civil servants who we were about to make redundant because we'd offered them full-time jobs but actually um, COVID has changed the vaccination program has been an enormous success and therefore their jobs don't exist so we've had to use temporary people um, given the uncertainty that we faced. You, I suppose I'm now looking at you, uh, uh, Dr. Harris. Um, this uh, change in operations, the different uh, work that you have to take on board at short notice, do you think you're going to rely still on this high percentage of consultants between 40 and 50 percent? So, so that's certainly not the ambition, and we have, and Shona may want to come in in a moment because we have a very detailed rump down plan. Uh, taking into account as far as we can predictions around where the pandemic will be and where the new organisation will be. <clears throat> and that is a staged plan, so it's looking forward uh, over what we hope will be uh, the, a wave now uh, into the end of March, uh, and then a completely, so covering still the pandemic, and then obviously the forward flow of the organisation going forward. Um, I think picking up some of the points, though, which Baroness Harding has made, it is quite challenging. So, for example, this afternoon, I know my next meeting will be to completely review all of the work we're doing, including all of the budgets and all of the skills and capacity that we need because the changes in policy will mean very very significant changes to the way we're working so for example uh, if we are not tracing as much we have a potential yeah. drop down yeah. on that but we have Thank winter you. planning arising and as covid goes down we may well have flu rising so it's not simply um, about being able to replace on a long-term basis and ramp down. It's about continuously changing. Um, and I think one of the things which perhaps hasn't been highlighted, um, we've just launched, so last, last week, a formal consultation. So we've got very advanced plans for the organisation for 11,500 staff. Um, this is quite a big undertaking in the middle of a pandemic and as we build a new organisation. Uh, but it has great opportunities as well. The, the difficulty, one of the key difficulties is actually is in retaining our staff because many of them have come exactly contributing to the public health mission of managing and supporting control of the pandemic uh, on short term contracts and when just at the moment we're unable to offer substantive contracts until we're past the consultation period. So this is probably the most critical time uh, of the organisation's development where we are trying to ramp down uh, staff, we are consultants, we have 
very, very significant yeah. policy changes, and we have the risk of loss of staff that we currently have. On a positive note, however, and picking up uh, Dido's point, many people who have come into the organisation absolutely share a public health mission to protect lives going forward, and I think if we can just get past that, we have a great opportunity for the organisation. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And uh, yeah, we all yeah. accept that everybody's trying to do the right thing here, yeah. uh, and they've got public service missions, of course. Uh, uh, Ms Dunn, give us more comfort that you're going to wean uh, the organisation off expensive consultants and get better value, please. This is a really sharp area of focus, I have to say. So um, uh, even just over the last few weeks, Test and Trace has been doing a really granular bottom-up exercise, looking at each directorate um, in turn, looking at, take, I mean, take as a given all of the things that, um, that Jenny and Dido have just said about the unpredictability of the situation, but nonetheless, each directorate going through in great detail um, uh, both uh, what they're going to have to achieve over the coming month and the context in which they're going to be achieving it and developing their workforce plan and strategy, which I am going through with them. They have very extensive plans to bring the consultant numbers down um, substantially between now and uh, next March. Um, as as um, Dr. Harris just said, of course, um, uh, those plans, there'll be, there'll be further opportunities that come forward over the next month or so, and I expect to see those numbers come down a bit more. I'm keeping a very, very close eye on this, and, and not just on consultant numbers, but contingent labour numbers overall, um, and the committee can absolutely be assured that we won't take our eye off this ball. Thank you for that, and, and we will watch it with interest. And, and the reason I asked the question, and the reason I'm sceptical, is this, and I don't want to steal Mr Carden's uh, uh, thunder either, but um, about two months ago, I was outside the car park in the co-op in Blyner, in my ah, We're getting the important part of things now, <laughs> Blyner Gwent. It's somewhere I, I stop off, usually on a Thursday night when I'm driving out <coughs> to... to pick up some uh, pasta and a sauce of my... Okay, I think we just... Okay. <laughs> I'm sure this is winning you votes, Mr. Okay, so, so, uh, uh, it's, it's a favourite uh, uh, retail spot for me, I can tell you, especially on a cold winter okay, night. But on. anyway, <laughs> um, do you know what? And I spoke to... There's a, there was a temporary testing site there, and there were about a dozen, I think, mighty uh, staff working there, doing a great job, good people. But uh, the truth is... Uh, there was very little footfall on that Friday afternoon where I was there. And I suppose my worry is, are you gripping um, the uh, programmes that you roll out to ensure they're effective and value for money? Because my takeaway that afternoon, even though I'm very fond of the co-op in car park <laughs> in Flyner, was that my sense was you weren't. So... Give us some comfort you're going to do that uh, better. I'll, I'll, I'll come in first, actually, on that, because I, 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 mean, raise, um, I, I won't comment on your shopping, but I'll, you raise a lot of other points. Uh, but, um, uh, there's one thing that we should say, but part of the whole point of creating UK HSA was to bring certainty to this operation and move it out of uh, its entrepreneurial phase uh, into this is a permanent thing with permanent jobs in it. So that whole process is... Uh, uh, part of that. And then the issue you have just raised um, uh, comes back to uh, the discussion we had with Mr Gardner right at the beginning of this, of how you balance uh, traditional efficiency with access. So the question of, particularly when you're dealing with uh, difficult to reach uh, uh, communities, um, having access everywhere regardless of whether it is used all the time, um, is an object of policy. Now, I don't know if that's the case in uh, the, uh, 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 the situation that you raise, but we certainly take the principle that, you know, if somebody needs a test, they ought to be able to access it easily. Um, and we do not take the yeah. view that, you know, that one over there, even though it only gets a few, shut it down if that is providing I think access to a nicely, actually, community. To, to yes. Mr Carden, if I can just get yes. chip in there, to Mr Dan Carden. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Chair, and no thunder, but uh, welcome to our, our witnesses. Uh, thanks for, for coming today. And Dr Harries, could I perhaps start with you? And I, I think hearing from your experience as Baroness Harding and the ways in which you've tried to change and develop, uh, test and trace, 
I think you've both been at pains today to talk about the involvement of local authorities, um, the importance of devolving down. Uh, we've, been, we've heard for months and, and if not years, the desire to move away from consultants. Uh, and I speak to my, uh, I, I speak to directors of public health locally um, who tell me th things have improved over uh, a period of time. Uh, there's been more engagement. But what they want is more investment in local pr public health protection officers. They want, they, they want responsibility at a local level. And it just gets me thinking, is this not a design flaw that comes from day one where we've tried to do something from Whitehall, uh, from the top, top down, fragmented. You're renewing contracts with Serco this year for 300 odd million pounds. Uh, the number of consultants remain uh, too high uh, and when I look at what you've actually spent locally um, about 2 billion handed to local authorities 176 million for test and trace support payments 13 million for practical support for self-isolation 149 million for rapid testing these are tiny tiny figures uh, isn't too much just being held right at the top fragmented and handed over to, that to Dr. the Harrison? private sector. Um, thank, thank you for the question. Um, uh, obviously, I'm, I'm trying to learn from uh, whatever has been uh, developed through Test and Trace and take the good learning of that forward and try and offer uh, fresh insights as well. And for me, some of that comes from actually having been a director of public health in several local authorities. So I um, like to think, and I, I think it's great, that I have a good working relationship with all of those directors of public health, which is actively continuing now I'm in this role. Um, and in fact, on Monday, I had the first group with uh, a group meeting exactly to have this question, which is, how does national work with regional and local uh, in the new health security agency? Uh, what is the design for that? Uh, and I've asked actually them to come forward with different designs so we can contrast and compare uh, between the Faculty of Public Health, the Association of Directors of Public Health, um, SOLIS and, and local government agency and actually the one that we had forgotten from the room and decided we'd need there was the Charleston uh, Institute of Environmental Health exactly for the reasons that you say uh, because we recognise how important local authorities are um, and that all health protection issues start with individuals um, and we have lots of things we can do outside COVID to support okay. the health well, protection. I, thought, I think the, you, you have the public looking at the vaccine rollout saying what a success this is uh, led, led and delivered by our National Health Service and the criticisms and the polling shows uh, public dissatisfaction with test and trace uh, because they see it as privatised and they see it as fragmented. Do, are you going to empower local authorities and not just have a better working relationship with them but actually hand over more of your budget uh, and allow them to employ more staff? So, so just to be clear, we will have to make a, or I will have to make a full business case uh, in the spending review going forward for the new health security agency. So I think you know that that is something to come forward. Um, and the agency is that what you want to do, or do you want, so, or will it be maintained? So I think what I want is a system which works best to protect the health of the population, and undoubtedly there is a key role for local authorities in doing that. And uh, I would also venture to say that I think in the time that I know I've been uh, in public health and the uh, from 2013, so a lot of the health protection skills uh, actually moved away from local authorities, and I think there's an opportunity for us to support that. Now, quite what the model for doing that would be is one that we need to discuss, and, and I think my ambition would be to, to design with local authorities. But I think the other important thing is that the uh, Health Security Agency also has a global, uh, international role and a national one, and it is about getting the proportionate balance of that right um, it, across the whole system. Uh, so absolutely recognising local, but also recognising this is a UK national infrastructure. Yes, could could, could so I add, I mean, obviously, I mean, you're raising extremely important questions that we debate all the time, and, um, uh, and um, as we've acknowledged, uh, working with local authorities in this area is one of the re areas that has evolved and we have changed our approach. However, you're raising two slightly separate issues. So there's national versus local, um, and then there's contractors versus permanent uh, uh, permanent employees. Now, on the national to local, I mean, you raised the question of vaccines. That is a very national program. 
Um, it's one of its great strengths, National Health Service, nationally procured, national standards, national access, same offer everywhere. Um, it is not a given that local equals better. Um, there are a lot of cases where it is, but there are also cases where national scale and that sort of vaccine approach um, are also extremely important, and that's true in test and trace. So what we need to do here is find the right balance of where are national standards and national entitlements. hasn't worked. Um, well, you raise the, the question of the vaccine program. Um, that is a national health service program run to national standards Within with a single the case national. Of test and trace. Yeah, well, and this is where um, uh, uh, these questions are worthy of debate. So I'm not disagreeing with you that there is an absolutely vital local um, uh, local role, but there are also very important national roles, um, as the vaccine rollout shows. As it were. Um, so I, I, I'm not disputing your question and your, uh, the thrust of your argument at all. I'm just saying it's more about deciding what is actually best done nationally, as I say to national standards, national frameworks, economies of scale, and where is that local knowledge that we've pointed to in a number so of So for times, example, just to cut to the chase on that, yeah. so the testing yeah. and the, the logistics of getting testing is something that would have been difficult to have delivered locally. Exactly. But well, yeah. testing so, centres. So, 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 but, but even I there, there I think it's it's more sophisticated and subtle actually than that, and that's why the, this debate and raising these questions is, is entirely right. So local decision making on where to, to site testing centres, what well, hours... I meant testing, I meant the labs really. So, so the lab yes, structure the, the, and the barcoding of tests. That, that's, a, that's a perfect mm -hmm. and, the, and the data but, but the testing centres which I think Mr. Mr. Dickardin was referring to, are more local. Absolutely. So at each part of the testing, tracing, isolation support process, it requires really quite careful, collaborative yet, thought the, yet on... you commissioned the testing centre centrally, but Mr. Cardin, I think Well, no, no, we, we don't, actually. We work very collaboratively, and local authorities, are, um, the local testing sites are, uh, are set up and, and manned um, by local authorities, and that's been one of the successes in reaching out to the more vulnerable groups in society, precisely because... We recognise, just as you say, that local authorities are likely to be the best at reaching those communities. Yeah. And just to be and just to be absolutely clear, we are not saying we have always got this balance right. No. Um, which is why and your questions just, are important. Just to evidence that balance working dynamically at the moment, where we have local zero, which is very much about giving um, local authorities the control of the tracing, actually some of them, because of the sharp rise now, need to hand some of that back. Uh, because it needs national capacity, it, it's overstretching local capacity. So I think the really important thing here is about flexibility and recognising the value of both national and local working together. Uh, can I just move on, because I did want to ask about uh, contracts, and uh, could I ask Shona Dunn, I think you would be the, the right person, to just how have you managed conflicts of interest in the handing out of uh, big contracts? So um, uh, all contracts that have been um, that have been let during the pandemic have been through the same procedures that the department would normally use. We've um, we've had some uh, expedition of those, but all of the um, uh, due diligence you would expect us to undertake in terms of conflicts of interest, but also in terms of capability, value for money, uh, technical. Uh, um, uh, uh, meeting of the requirement, etc., have been undertaken with all of those contracts and conflicts of interest uh, are routinely recorded as part of the due diligence process. Yeah, I think th there was a, a delay with many of the uh, contracts being published. It's up to five months for the Deloitte contract being published. And um, I did want to ask about uh, the health minister. Uh, James Bethel, uh, who has links with Deloitte, and Deloitte seems to have uh, some of the largest contracts, and as we've heard earlier, um, the largest number of consultants uh, that are being... Uh, is that just a matter that's simply recorded as a conflict of interest? Just, uh, just for so figure 14 to, on page 41, I highlight some of these issues. Um, it, it, important to note the, the role of ministers uh, in this. So of course, ministers are... Um, uh, uh, can be involved in uh, investment decisions as part of the approval process for contracts, but they are uh, not involved uh, in the selection process itself. They're not uh, involved in the contract management. Um, uh, if there is a direct conflict of interest um, for a minister, that will be uh, recorded. Um, uh, and on the publication of contracts, 
Um, as you as you rightly say, uh, there's definitely been um, a, a catching up, but um, I think we are in a position now, uh, barring some contracts that were uh, let in April and May and are uh, still due to be published, where we are up to date with publishing on Contract Finder. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Carden. Sarah Olney, MP. Thank you, Chair. I'm going to try and speed up and canter through some of these uh, some of these other issues we still need to cover. Um, the lateral flow devices, Mr. Clark mentioned this earlier on, um, as, as per the report, 691 million test kits have been sent out, but only 96 million have been registered as used. Um, I wonder, uh, Baroness Harding, if you could just say, what were your original plans for lateral flow devices? Um, why do you think uh, this, um, you know, only a small number have been recorded and, wh and what lessons did you learn from the earlier parts of the rollout uh, as, as you ramped up that sort of community testing? Yeah, so, as I think that um, Dr. Harris said earlier, um, the lateral flow tests were developed in order to fight, provide a really easy um, and much cheaper way of people finding out whether they've got the disease asymptomatically. So the purpose of the deployment of lateral flow tests has been to find positive cases. That's been the primary objective. Um, we've done that very fast. We were um, one of the very first countries to make universal asymptomatic testing available to all citizens. Um, you know, we, we made that offer available at the end of March, and, and there are other Western nations that are only just beginning to, to start to do that now. Um, so that was the primary objective. And lateral flow devices have been extremely effective at finding people who have the disease and don't know it. So as, as the NAO report says, up to um, the end of May, 223,000 positive cases found, and found in some of our most um, high-risk environments in social care, in the NHS, um, in schools, etc. Um, so it's important to see that as the objective. And because we were rolling things out so fast, again, as Dr. Harry said, we, we made a decision to push stock, to push tests out um, to the organisations and then for those organisations to hand the tests out. So the first phase of it was essentially filling that supply chain pipeline so that people could get the tests really quickly. Um, as we've got... Um, as we've learnt, as people have got more used to doing regular lateral flow testing, we're able to now migrate to more pull ordering where individuals or individual organisations are able to order only the tests that they need rather than centrally allocate out. So we've moved, that's one of the big learnings, has been able to move to that uh, a pull model. We've moved to that pull model in social care. The NHS are just transitioning to that now. Um, and all of us as individuals ordering tests to be delivered at home, obviously that's a pull model. I order it only when I, I need it. So that's been one of the big learnings, that moving to that pull model enables us to be more efficient at deploying the stock. Uh, what we do know is, Dr. Harris said, that a lot of people take the tests and don't report them. The surveys say it's sort of 40%. I was actually talking to one of my old team yesterday who apologised profusely that she'd just thrown her lateral flow test away in the bin uh, and hadn't reported it. But it is, uh, it's, it's completely understandable that people are doing that. Um, and so there is a lot of work, and I'll hand over to, to Jenny, that the team are doing to make it easier, to make it the instructions simpler, and to communicate why we need to know, regardless of whether the result is positive or negative, um, that you've done the test. Okay. Is only go back to you. Um, yes, so I just want to, to skip on actually because we're getting short of time. But this is a, a, um, a question for Dr. Harris. The Independent are reporting today that lateral flow uh, tests may not be free after this month. I wondered if you could per per potentially comment on that and also whether any modelling has been done about how that might affect take up of tests, reporting, um, and, and how that might impact schools. 
If I go in reverse order, for schools, we definitely have a commitment and uh, working with the Department for Education, who are working obviously with, with the school's representatives themselves, to do um, two supervised tests at the start of the autumn term. That's obviously was very successful at the last start of term, uh, encourages students to rem remind them how to do the tests. Um, and as they yeah, come so the back two then, and then what else? And, and, and then, then we'll, on yeah. for the rest of the uh, rest of September, and then to be reviewed for children, um, for, uh, for free still. Yes. For, well, for, for not free because the taxpayers paying, but but not yes. schools don't be charged. Yes. Free to the individual. Yes, for schools and and for the general public at the moment, it will be possible under the uh, universal offer to uh, have testing until the end of August. But I say that because you will realise from the conversation we've had and the significant policy changes uh, that we, we obviously need to work through what this means in terms of uh, what, uh, back to the modelling, mm. about uh, how many people are vaccinated, how many tests we think uh, are going to be utilised and where they're best utilised. And one of the reasons I say that is because um, we have been using lateral flow devices uh, predominantly in an unvaccinated population. Obviously that's changing now, but yep. in school settings, for example, and, and working population, it's mostly younger. Um, and we need to, and people's symptomatology may change. So, for example, you may still be able to uh, transmit infection, but fewer people will. Okay. Um, you may have lower okay. viral loads. So, I think there's a lot of uh, scientific elements behind this that we need to take into Zombie. consideration. Thank you very much. Um, in our last session, one of the uh, weaknesses we identified, it was really difficult to tell what the contribution that Test and Trace was making overall to reducing the transmission of COVID-19. Um, and the, the department accepted our recommendation that more data needed to be collected. Um, I wonder if, uh, Sir Chris, if I could just ask you, what progress have you made on reviewing your, your data collection and your plans for as asymptomatic testing? Um, well, on the... Um, uh on, the actual, on asymptomatic testing, I'll hand back to Jenny, but on the, um, uh, on the effectiveness, it's exactly as set out uh, in the National Audit Office uh, report uh, and the uh, uh, 18 to 33 per cent reduction that we were quoting earlier with all the caveats set out in the National Audit Office report on uh, the ongoing work. So we're in a much clearer position, uh, say not the final position, uh, but a much clearer position on what is the effectiveness of the programme. Uh, and then on the individual evaluation, of asymptomatic testing? So, uh, so there are a number of different work streams ongoing on that, but we have, in just in terms of the po test positives, for we, uh, I can provide that data for you for each channel, so you can see how many cases have been detected in each area. So, for example, uh, 49,000 in uh, nurseries, primary schools, secondary schools and colleges. So we can see by each channel. Um, but I think uh, it, it's really important as well. You can look at wider data. So the point I made earlier about care homes is one of the, there's a combination there of using PCR and lateral flow devices, uh, and the case numbers uh, and uh, helpfully the you know and, and really uh, welcomely the deaths in in care homes through the second wave have been significantly reduced. So I think there are a number of wider areas as well. But each program uh, is evaluated uh, not just for the uh, the numbers that are positive, but also actually the approach that's been taken to see whether we can improve that with uh, okay. local providers. Uh, Ms Olney. Thank you. I just wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, future plans because you've already made a reference there to uh, potentially changing the role of lateral flow uh, testing uh, come August. Well, the first thing I wanted to know is um, to what extent are you p planning for surge testing? I noticed there's quite a lot of footage in the news today about lots of people in the pub last night. And I'm sure we can expect to see those scenes again on Sunday, apparently. Um, so I just wonder if you're anticipating surges of uh, testing demand uh, going forward and how you plan to meet those. Yeah, I, I'm not going to trace them back to the individual television screens, but um, <laughs> uh, and, and, I, and actually, interestingly, one of the comments was the early studies did show that uh, there was a gender difference, which was particularly in the Scottish data. Actually, that had, I think in Scotland now, that has evened out into uh, a non-gender specific. So obviously, everybody's watching football now, I think. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, so as we as we go forward, um, it will be important to understand how to use these various tests uh, very specifically and in the right right way, which I think is the point that you're uh, referring to. Um, 
looking back at some of these individual uh, areas, so events, uh, we, we know actually, we, we think with those particular examples, it's not, it's not so much, certainly it's not the outside football match, which is usually the problem, it's the going through the gates, it's, it's the socialising, and it might be the long trip down in the coach from, from Scotland particularly, which causes the problem. So all that data uh, will come through, obviously, and we will follow all those contacts out. Um, and how are you involving local authorities and other stakeholders in de designing a sort of future operating model for, for test and trace? Uh, so that goes back to the point that I made earlier. What, what I've done internally, and I think quite bravely, has, has actually been to use the uh, specialist skills that we have, and by that I mean not just the scientific skills but data analytics, to, um, to use a, a self-design model to actually build the new organisation um, and that is contributed to our uh, overarching organogram now as we go forward, trying to look forward as well to the sorts of health risks that we might see in the future, so things like um, entomology, so um, uh, um, vector-borne disease for example that we may not see now but could become part of climate change uh, and, and looking for uh, the work that we particularly will be working with uh, the US on the Centre for Pandemic Preparedness. So that's the internal part and then it's exactly the part which Mr Carden has raised around how do we link and work with colleagues in other critical parts of the system, whether that be in local authorities but equally with the NHS. And so the organogram is designed to have docking points but the real critical point will be the way of working and the roundtable that I said uh, I chaired on Monday and we've got three sessions built in specifically to try and work through some models and again co-create with local authorities what that model might look like for the future. Ms Olney. Um, and just uh, very quickly, just to finish, um, are you going to continue to support schools with their testing and tracing uh, programme from September? Well, just so it's, we have agreed a, a position as I've just described for the month of September until the end of September, and then obviously we'll be reviewing. And quite rightly, you would expect that to be in light of the uh, epidemiology, uh, vaccine development, and a number of other uh, issues. Thank you very much, Chair. Now, just be clear: Are you saying that there could still be free lateral flow tests available to people after the end of August, but you just haven't planned? You don't know what the planning is yet because we're well, waiting. I think for the you, things. you would expect us to um, want to look at how effective they are in in yeah yeah. In no, a no, new I'm world. saying, but it's just I think well, it's just that people get them for free now. If there's a prospect, as Ms. Olney was highlighting, that people have to pay for them, that could drive behaviour. So I just wonder if. if you yeah, give any reassurance that it's actually, under review at the end of the I would perhaps re rephrase yeah. it to whether it is an effective and essential right. public health intervention yeah. going forward, then I'm sure it will be, it's likely to be part of uh, the, the health So, so if it's necessary, moment. it's yes. likely the, the old agency will yeah. still fund my, it. My concern in not putting too much emphasis no, that's on fine. that that's fine. Well, I'm, just, I'm just trying to get, if you're suddenly going to start charging at the end of August, that no, might be No, so for, for schools, behavior. absolutely, oh, exactly okay. as, as oh. Sir Wilma said, it's, it's, it's okay. there for children to use exactly as okay. they have been now until the end but of September. But not just in schools, but for, for families who are collecting them as well. Yeah, until the end of August, yeah. that is. And then you will review it. It yeah. needs so to be reviewed within the decisions to be taken. Yeah, I'm just saying, I just want to know if there's a cliff edge which you're suddenly going to start charging, but you're still reviewing if it's useful there, there, at this point. There is no, there is no cliff be. edge, but there is a plan to be developed going forward based on the epidemiology. It could include charging for them. Uh, well, nobody has discussed charging. Okay, yet at that's all. fine. That's, well, that's really helpful. No one's discussed yeah. charging. Well, we'll leave it right, there. Right, for now. Yeah. Let, well, let's be absolutely clear yeah. on this point. What, what, no. what we are doing is we are looking at what is the public health case yeah. use going forward, and decisions. Yeah. People are have to clearly to pay for the holidays and things anyway. So, I mean, there's obviously an element of that for, for personal uh, benefit. Mr. Greg Clark. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Chair. Just another um, curious question about business cases, um, perhaps to Baroness uh, Harding. Um, the November 2020 business case for 10 billion expansion uh, of testing uh, stated that part of the point was a legacy uh, to the NHS and it was to provide uh, sustainable modern diagnostic capability uh, including early diagnostics for cancer, cardiovascular and metabolic diseases. Um, but according to the NAO, NHS England said that they had not been informed of the business plan commitment for them to use test and trace labs for this purpose at the time that the commitment was made. Um, and they've only recently started to have any conversations uh, about that. How could that representation have been made in support of the business case to give assistance to the NHS when the NHS were blissfully unaware of it? 
Well, well, firstly, it's really clear that we need the lab capacity for COVID now. So I think let's separate whether or not the, 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 the recommendation to, to build the lab was a good idea. Um, in terms of potential for the future, uh, well, certainly I've had ongoing discussions with various people in um, NHS England and improvement over the course of the last 12 months, uh, uh, recognising that one of the big learnings for us as a country as we step back is that we went into this pandemic without the diagnostics capability that some other countries had and we've had to scale it up and build it from scratch. So I think there's broad recognition across all of the parts of the um, health family um, that coming out of this we need to you know, be in a much stronger place. Um, I, in terms of the specifics um, mentioned, I, it sort of surprised me the statement in the in the in the NAO report because you agreed the NAO report didn't you um, per was Baroness Harding not personally, but no, the department not personally. Done. Done. So personally, it surprised me the, the comments that were referred to NHS England colleagues because I know that I had conversations with them. I think it's probably most likely that the reality is that in January, February, March, as we were starting to work through what the sort of legacy could look like, and not unreasonably at all, everyone in the NHS was extremely focused on managing the second wave and the coming out of lockdown. And, and I, as far as I'm aware those conversations are now sort of fully ongoing. This was November, um, uh, to be clear. I think it does point, I mean, this is the second instance of a representation that's been made in a business case that it seems to be, at the very least, questionable, if not... Perhaps if I could just, sorry, I, I didn't... Uh, the November comment, I mean, my... The first uh, director in charge of testing, Sarah Jane Marsh, um, who is uh, back in her day job and has been since the beginning of November as the chief exec of Birmingham Women's and Children's Hospital, Sarah Jane initiated discussions with Professor Mike Richards and other colleagues in NHS England in um, September and October on legacy. So I don't think it's fair to say that there were no discussions at all with the NHS, quite the opposite. So the NAO... No, I think no, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty sure. So, so, certainly, I read it. I, 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 I read that as being about detailed plans, which there are not. I, mean, yeah. sorry, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think the NAO got it wrong. I to be clear, the NHS Test and Trade agreed uh, yeah. quote, to draw up a detailed benefits realisation strategy by the okay. end of December 2020. We clearly yeah. lots yeah. of things were going on in December 2020, but yeah. that's not so, so I think it's we correct. We acknowledge that's that's so, sorry, okay. there, there was a. And we don't disagree from, with from my memory, there, no. there, there was a general acceptance of that case, and we have said um, repeatedly, um, and the uh, Chief Medical Officer says this uh, a lot as well, that uh, the UK was badly placed on diagnostics before uh, the pandemic, uh, and we need to come uh, not just on pandemic, but more generally, um, and we need to come out of the pandemic with a much better... I, say, I think it's an excellent and, initiative. Yeah. And um, then, uh, if, but if you're saying... Is there a detailed plan for how we would do that? Which I expect uh, the NHS would answer the question. Not. Quite clearly, not. Yeah. Excellent initiative, uh, but I would expect if the NHS is to be given a legacy, they might be participate in, um, in oh, of course. the, the agreement of, uh, of, of that. Uh, finally, Chair, uh, if I may, just to kind of uh, reflect on uh, on where we are uh, at the moment. Um, thankfully. With the, the vaccines, we've got strong protection, and therefore the role of NHS Test and Trace is going to change. And uh, Jenny Harris and Sir Chris have talked about the ways in which that might be the case. One way or another, um, we are not going to have to contact Trace quite so, so much, whether it's in August uh, or sooner. Is it right to, to say that the, the future role of Test and Trace will be to, as it were, kind of to spring to life and to pounce on, God forbid, any new variant that escapes a vaccine. Um, and that will be, a, a, if not the most important, and certainly a very important role for, uh, for Test and Trace. Is that, is that what uh, yeah, you're so referring to? I, I would just like to challenge perhaps the idea that we won't contact trace, we will be contact tracing. That is a, an absolute bedrock of any infectious disease practice. It's the isolation which is changing and that's a, a risk-based element. So we will keep contact tracing. Um, and over time, of course, we hope as COVID subsides, it will go back much more to the level of what I would call business as usual contact tracing for diseases we usually have. Uh, but yes, I mean, I think the, the vaccine, uh, monitoring vaccine effectiveness is a really critical component. Colleagues in Public Health England do that and they will be formally part of the UK Health Security Agency. Uh, continuing to test, test as well. So at the moment, Port and Down uh, continue to evaluate all of the lateral flow devices and other tests against 
um, new variants, again, a really important one. Um, so those components, absolutely, are all critical ones. Firstly, can we detect the new, can we spot them, can we detect them, uh, how many of them have we got, and are our vaccines effective? And that spring time, is, is that very clearly understood, the skills for that? Because we think back over the course of the pandemic, initially we didn't have enough testing capacity, as has been well rehearsed. Uh, we came to September, the return of schools, universities, workplaces. Again, we didn't have enough testing capacity, um, and people had to be dissuaded from taking tests. We've had an exchange about the, the aspiration to avoid a second lockdown um, through uh, a test and trace uh, alternative to that. Uh, and now we've got surging infections, which, thank God for the vaccinations, are not having what would otherwise be the impact on hospitals. So we need a lot rests, it seems to me, on test and trace in the future. And the, the record over the last year has not been one of reliable springing into life to wrestle this virus to the ground. Are you absolutely seized of the need to do that and are you confident that you'll be able to break out of that pattern of the, the last year or so I would just like to go back to some of the earlier conversations and just flag all the points which were made, which is test and trace is a component part of this. The pandemic is changing and it will continue to. Uh, and in fact, actually, when it started, uh, I, I don't think test and trace and when it was conceived, although probably my, some of my public health clinical colleagues will have thought that the issue of variants arising and causing the waves quite as they have done uh, with the speed was probably not factored into the organisation's development. So there's, there's a lot of things that we can learn from this. They are clearly... Uh, issues which arise in pandemics, but uh, we haven't had one like this in any of our lifetimes. So it is, as, as, uh, as Chris has said, exceptional. So I think, yes, we have some really strong skills. We have, um, as the chair has said, uh, really good genomics uh, to take forward, and we will continue to do that. But it isn't simply a matter of can test and trace do it. As we have seen with Delta, if you have a very, very transmissible variant, as we're going to see across Europe, it is almost likely to be around. So the, the criticality is getting this uh, rapid flow, and that's exactly where I hope the Health Security Agency will come in, between understanding, keeping on top of the genomic sequencing, and actually having those strong linkages with, um, with academia, with research. So we've got colleagues, for example, with, uh, who look at structural biology, vaccine development, and keep trying to actually reach really uh, the limits of science as we, we have known it, because we've learned to do things much more quickly and bring the time into developing new vaccines. So we are always staying one step ahead. Do you think there's been yeah, any doubt at, at any point about the, the excellence of the, uh, of the science? It's been the operational performance uh, of test and trace that has, I think, given rise uh, for repeated we, concerns. We're yeah, in a I... slightly different era as well, and it goes back to the, yeah, the issue. So I think the we recognise has... at the beginning that things yeah. have changed a bit as we've I mean, I'd, 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 time, so Chris, we Yes, I mean, I'd, I'd add two things which go very much with the flow of your comments. Um, and um, I've said some of this to the committee before. Um, I mean, this is um, the big lesson is what's your underlying resilience. Yes, um, yes. Now, and as you say, exactly. in some very big areas, like particularly science, R&D, universities, also the NHS, the military, and a lot actually, we've had underlying resilience, which has allowed us to be flexible quickly, um, which is the other big lesson. And there are some other areas, you know, right down to you know, lab capacity yeah. for diagnostics, yeah. where we didn't have underlying resilience. Some people moved heaven and earth to create it, but that's slow and it doesn't have the flexibility well, to think, respond yeah, to yeah. those. Well, so, just, so the yeah, challenge yeah. going forward yeah. is that one, is to have the underlying resilience that then gives you the flexibility to respond to unexpected things. And I think you're completely right. I mean, in some areas we have had that big time and we have benefited, and in other areas we've had to build it up from scratch, and that's really hard. Well, and certainly things like the vaccine programme, which grew from scratch to procure them, that was at fast pace, but the actual delivery of it, of course, was something that had a, a residual well, I mean, yes, a I system, mean, a system, exactly, yes. had a system that was already in place well, doing it at on, a different scale. And, yeah, and, so. and, and right through the chain, so and, we and, have great and, universities and longer, to develop them, and, yeah, longer, and longer to plan for that, because the vaccines once procured, there was longer to plan, so I think that yeah. is just a point worth making. Can I just go back to the report? Um, it, I just, I've just checked, and it is absolutely clear that NHS England also signed off the report, so just to be really clear, so that paragraph uh, 21 on page 13, the summary of the NHS report was agreed both by the department and NHS England. 
But look, if £150 million for investment in lab infrastructure helps prov provide early diagnostics for diseases such as cancer, that small amount out of the £37 billion so far allocated to this, though not spent and not under stress, not audited, is a prize that we should be grateful for. So lots still to come. Dr. Harris will be having you back once you're fully established um, at some point. After, we'll give you a bit of time after the autumn. Um, but we want to want to follow through these promises and see what is our long-term legacy out of what is eye-watering sums of taxpayers' money that have been allocated to test and trace, and, of course, what the long-term lessons are about efficacy. But can I thank our witnesses very much indeed for their patience and their time today, which is a long but useful hearing. Um, so Baroness Dido Harding, uh, formerly of Test and Trace, um, Sir Chris Wilmore, Permanent Secretary, Dr. Jenny Harris, Jonathan Marin from the Department of Health and Shona Dunn, the second permanent secretary at the Department of Health. Thank you very much indeed. The transcript will be up on the website uncorrected in the next couple of days. Our report will be due in the autumn after the summer recess. Order, order. Portcullis House, the Grimmond Room. 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 <laughs>